Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to episode 36 of the BJJ Brick Podcast. This is part two of our Injury Stories series we're doing here. Part two of two, I guess. This is Byron. I'm here with Gary. What's up, Gary? Hey, doing great. Can't wait for another episode on injuries. Had a great episode last week, and we got some more great stories to share this week. I've learned a lot talking to our friends out there that that have stepped up and and shared their stories, and and I I know that you uh, audience members have learned a lot as well. I mean, really be able to help your teammates get past their injuries by knowing more about them, and then if you're in the unfortunate situation where you've been injured, you know what to expect, and, and as far as you know, timelines go, and how you could maybe heal up a little bit better and, and quicker. Yeah, and you know the one thing I, I think that I heard a lot of people mention was the forgotten psychological aspect uh, of being out. Um, mostly, people are talking about the pain of their injury and how they can't move or this and that. But uh, I've heard a lot of people mention the psychological aspect of it's kind of rough not being on the train and what do you do with your time? So uh, that's always good to hear that and ways to cope with that also. Yep. Lots of different aspects of being injured, not just physical, guys. But before we get too far in, far into the injuries, we've got some good news. We've got a rash guard giveaway going on. Definitely. Uh, Fuji Sports has uh, offered to give one of our listeners a, uh, a rash guard. You get your choice of the Robo or the Moco. So you have your choice of the the lion, which is the moco, more of an artistic. Uh, it's rash tiger, guard. actually. Or what was that? Tiger, not lion. Actually, yeah. Tiger. Yeah. Tiger. Yes. L- lions have uh, lions are cool, but for design purposes, like Tigers the stripes of a tiger, game. that's that's yeah. a real cool design having the the tiger stripes. Yep. And then the, the robo rash guard, which is the one I'm wearing uh, now here when I'm grappling, is. Uh, Basically, it looks like a robot. Uh, got the abs, got the pecs, got the muscles rolling. So, uh, makes me uh, feel a little bit stronger. Yep. And um, you know, Gary's trying to always tell me, you know, how to get better at jujitsu and stuff. So when I'm wearing my um, Moco rash guard with the tiger, um, he tells me not to not to go for the ankle locks anymore because you've never seen a tiger grab anything by the ankle. Byron. I do not agree with that statement. I've watched a <laughs> lot of National Geographic. And I've seen a lot of times where they're chasing down a gazelle or a zebra, and sometimes they can't get up on the back right away. So they may go for the ankle right off the back. So I could, I could do I ankle locks? Pulling guard. They're not pulling guard. Okay. Sometimes the ankle might be the first bite. Then the paw is coming, which is almost like an underhook, knock them to the ground, they take side mount, and then they go straight for the neck, like you said. They will... Uh, uh, Right to the neck. So I've been avoiding when I'm wearing mine. I've been avoiding the ankle lock game. It's it's fair sometimes game. You when say. that guy's run when that uh, prey is running away from you, sometimes you can't catch it unless you swipe the back of the ankle. So All right. It may uh, come in handy sometimes. So I just gave you some good advice. Well, heads up, my friends on the mat. Uh, the me wearing the Moco rash guard does not mean that I won't do an ankle lock anymore. It is on, my friends. <laughs> the ankle locks are back. <laughs> Yep, and Gary will continue to do his uh, robot dance of destruction uh, anytime he Pop gets the opportunity. <laughs> Sometimes I've, the quarter, yeah, let's let's get on to the okay. Of the week, <laughs> well, uh, real quick, if you want to win one of these rash cards, oh, um, yeah. jump on the Facebook page, uh, like, comment, or share the show, and also put a picture up of the of the rash cards. You can do the same there. That'll get you entered into the to the drawing. If you don't have Facebook, you can do it on Twitter or just go to the website, bjjbrick.com, and comment on the show notes there, and, and that will get you entered in. And we'll give away yeah, one of these Don't forget soon. to uh, check out fujisports.com. You can go on the website there, uh, check out all their rash guards, all their gis, all their grappling shorts, T-shirts, uh, gear bags. Uh, they have about everything on there. And uh, uh, great supporters of the show, and, uh, and uh, we appreciate all their support and uh, all the great products they make. Yeah, well, Gary, let's, like you mentioned before, let's get into the quote here. This is from Dean Smith. He's a famous uh, basketball coach. And we don't always stick to jiu-jitsu quotes, obviously. Um, you know, a lot of these coaches, they could have coached anything. I mean, oh, they're like, yeah, they're, they're, it's fundamental principles principles of coaching. So um, and this, and he's speaking about mistakes here. So he goes, 
The quote is, What do you do with a mistake? Recognize it, admit it, lord from it, forget it. That's Dean Smith. We're all going to make mistakes, no ifs, ands, or buts. But the big thing is, you see people dwelling on the mistake. They, they tuck their head, and they're, they're so upset, and they never get past it. You know, we want to learn from our mistakes. So, you know, recognize it. You know, let's learn from it. But then, you know, forget about it. You know, and, and I don't mean just totally throw it out, you know, because you always, you know, let's say we're going back to jujitsu. You know, if I shoot a double and I leave my head, you know, lead with my head, I'm probably going to get guillotined. So, you know, you still want to remember not to do it, but don't dwell on it. Hey, everybody's made a mistake. Everybody's got caught. Everybody in basketball has got dunked on. Well, unless you just play kiddie basketball and there's nobody who can dunk in your league. But uh, it's going to happen. Yep, and you, like you said, recognize it and admit it. I mean, if you keep denying these mistakes, I mean, it's hard to induce because you're tapping out usually. So, I mean, that really smacks you in the face. Like this, you just made some mistakes, you know, to get to the situation. But it's important to learn from your, your mistakes. And jujitsu is great at that because, you know, basically 10 times out of 10, if you ask the guy who uh, tapped you out with an armbar what you did wrong or how you could try to prevent that next time maybe not every time but you could try to prevent it or do a little bit better escaping they're going to tell you they're, they're not going to hide secrets from you they shouldn't do that um this yeah, and that's about- what's so great about the sport i don't think i've ever had anybody tell me that besides you you know you <laughs> always just tell me to lead with my neck or or you know when you have me mounted you used to tell me to reach my arm straight up in the air uh, but i think that was you just you know because you like to win so much but i've never really been denied anybody <laughs> you know when i asked hey how did you uh how did you tell me out? It's, it's nice that people will tell you, and which basically makes it harder for them to get you next time. Yeah. It just makes us all better. I like the uh, the solid advice of when I'm on your back to, to look up to the – get your chin up, Gary. Get your chin <laughs> up. up. To the <laughs> and hold it there for yep. 10 seconds. You don't want me messing with your chin. Get that out of the way. Yeah. Yep. So. All right, Gary, that music is telling us that we've got to move on for the article of the week. We've got an article written by uh, Willie Laney. And this article is posted on scienceofskill.com. It is four keys to better BJJ. Gary, what's the first key here? You know, the first key is define your goals. Um, you know, and you hear that a lot of times. But the big thing is not not just define it. Clearly is the key word. Clearly define your goals. You know, if you don't know where you're going, you're never going to get there. Um, so, you know, we've got to have clear, clear goals. You know, when the examples he gives there is you know you don't want to just say hey i want to get better at my guard you know that's not you didn't do what dwell down deep enough into that you know it's still a little bit unclear basically what he's what he said there is uh, i want to work on three de la Hiva sweeps you know practicing each one on 100 times a week for the next months and uh, you know so he really you know dug down on that goal basically made it specific you know what he's going to do how long he's going to do it um and definitely it's going to help his help his game get better um, goal no, or part two there is uh instill a burning desire and uh burning desire a desire is simply a want and if you want something you probably won't get it uh, if you just want something the burning desire is what he says it's that constant yearning or drive you know so you're always thinking about it. It's on your mind 24-7. It's on your mind every day of the week. You know, you, you eat it, you sleep it, you breathe it. It's, you're always thinking about it, just like, you know, we are in jiu-jitsu. So, you know, you really, if you really want to get good at something, you've really got to like it and have that burning desire to get better at it. Yeah, I think that's kind of like if you're trying to remember somebody's name and you and you can't remember it, and, and then, you know, the day goes on and later on your brain figures it out. Like yeah. it, it'll put your brain yeah. into that mode where it's it's it's, it's trying to figure out these jujitsu problems you have while you're not even thinking about jujitsu, and then like you might oh I'm gonna try this or, or or let's move this way. So I think that burning desire is a pretty big key. The the third step or four the four, third key, man butchered that. The third key that he gives is to find peers that uh, fuel your focus. So he recommends getting uh, being around some like-minded individuals that have the same uh, goals and, and passions that you do, um, and that's going to help really motivate you. And you know, especially if they've already been able to achieve those goals that you're look, working towards, um, you know, the, the proof is in, in what they're able to accomplish and that it's possible. Um, so s- surrounding yourself by quality peers that that uh, they're going to help you reach your goals is huge. 
yeah, that actually care for you, that are there to help you, and uh, like you said, quality peers. Yep. And then the the last of the of the keys on the keychain here um, is the eighty twenty rule, and um, this, I guess it's broken down tw- two different ways. Um, you know, two sides of this coin. You could say eighty percent of the work you do gets you twenty percent of your results. Which is like, oh man, that's a waste, a lot of waste of time. <laughs> uh, the other side of that coin, flip it over, and twenty uh, percent of your work. Sometimes that'll get you eighty percent of your results. So find that that stuff that you could do, that positional sparring, that that drilling a certain position that you really like or that you're fired up about with your burning desire, and that'll get you a lot more results in a lot less time. Um, it, it'll really, I mean, this this one kind of ties them all together. Um, the eighty twenty rule. So, and that, and it's, it's a, it, that, that this rule, you know, exists in many other places other than jujitsu. I've heard about it, in, about, like every other, every job I've had, you know, they've mentioned, hey, this, you know, eighty twenty rule, eighty percent of the time, um, you spend gets you twenty percent of your results, and then the other twenty percent, that's where the magic is. That's 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 your big clients. That's your, that that's your high quality. Um, attacks that you're doing or your escapes that, that are working a lot. So find that, find your 80, 20 and, and spend time there and, and try to make the most out of those. Yep. And I tell you what my favorite part of this whole article is the very last sentence. And it goes back to, uh, you know, the BJJ brick philosophy that we have, uh, build your BJJ house on a solid foundation. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let Byron talk about the, how he came up with the name BJJ brick. Yeah, um, to to sum it up, um, if sometimes when you when you roll with somebody or compete with somebody and they have like just a few s- core moves that they're able to to use on you and it feels like you've been smashed by a brick, that's what that's what the philosophy is. Um, this person has um, arranged their game in a way to where um, if, if they could pull you into to their to their game and avoid your game, it's going to feel like a brick because you don't know what they're doing. Um, you know, I don't know what guy A in this tournament's good at, so um, that's his brick. Or even look at the world class guys. A lot of times, the opponents know what they're going to do. They still go out there and they get it done to them. Um, they're running into those brick such, techniques. Yeah. yeah, they've got such a solid foundation. It's like you just got hit with a brick. So uh, when I saw that sentence, I thought about you know how you always preach about the BJJ brick philosophy, and I was like, that that just hit it right on the head right there. Yeah, and base it really speaks out against trying to learn new uh flashy techniques all the time you know every every day you see new techniques online that you don't know and to try to learn all those constantly is going to get you nowhere that's that's your 80 percent of the time yeah. right there guys. yeah there's your yeah and you know your 20 as he says you know you work on your 20 you know get better there that's uh, going to yield the most results so yep good good uh thanks for throwing that in there gary that's good to to i forget you know sometimes we need to remind people kind of how that started and and uh, one of our, our core principles about how to get better at jujitsu. Yep. Awesome. Awesome article. So definitely check it out, and we'll put a link on the page there to it. So here we go. We've got some uh, uh, number of in- interviews lined up. Um, so we're just going to go from one to the next and uh, hang out and yep. listen to these stories, and, and hopefully you haven't experienced any of these yourselves, but uh, <laughs> keep training and if you, you have, do. You know, uh, hopefully uh, – you know, you, you've come back and and you you've shared some of your stories and ways to get better with some of your teammates. Yep, yep. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Like everyone in the, every one of these stories uh, emphasizes that in the end. You know, they got back on the mat. They're able to do what they want to do with their lives. So, here is the order of our guests that we have today. We start off with Tommy. He's going to share a story of his battle with testicular cancer and how he's back on the mat now. Then we have Adam Shacknoff, also known as Big Red. He's going to tell a story about how he injured his knee uh, quite a while ago and then um, basically re-injured it uh, later on. And, and then he also has some nerve damage to his foot. John Haskew comes on next with us, and he's going to tell us a little bit about he's had nine surgeries, and um, he's also had um, two major staph infections. So that's a big one to, to learn about and be aware of as well. After John, we move on to Michael Crampin. He tells us about how he broke his rib um, early on in his training, and uh, he was doing takedowns with another beginner, and just tell us about his recovery there. Our friend Mike is next after Michael. Um, He's going to tell us about his torn pectoral muscle he got while he was trying to escape a Kimura. And then we'll close with Will Horneff, who had a herniated disc and five bulging discs, 
and he has a way that he got rid of his injury that is a little different than the typical way. And, and you might also recognize um, Will Horneth from the movie The Sandlot. All right, guys, here we go. All right, my friends, I have Tommy on the line with me today. He's going to share a story about um, when he got testicular cancer and how that affected him, and and he's doing a lot better today. Yeah. How are you doing today, Tommy? I'm doing all right. How about you guys? Y'all doing good? Yeah, we are doing good. Um, it's been uh, an interesting day. We're talking to lots of people overcoming their, their difficulties in life is, and, and getting back to training. So um, it's been... Uh, it's been an interesting day. It's not our typical episode, and, and we're we're learning a lot today. Yeah, good. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, You know where you're from, who you train with, and any sort of training background you want to share? Yeah, sure, sure. I've been training since 2006, so that's all, uh, coming on eight years. Uh, yeah, yeah, eight years. I started at, I'm in Austin. Texas. Okay. And I uh, I started training out of a health and affiliate in town, and then after some people broke away and stuff like that, a bunch of uh, people from that academy went over to a Gracie Humaita Academy in town, and now I'm there, and I've been there for a couple years now, I think 2010 or maybe 11, actually. I've been training there. Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. Um <clears throat> We have you on today because you had testicular cancer, and uh, yeah, could you kind of just tell us what happened and how you found out and what that was like? Yes, yes. So uh, that all started in 2010. I uh, yeah, I was I no, I sort of figured it out. No, I didn't figure it out myself, but I noticed a lump on my testicle. You know, sometime in. January or so, and two months go by, and it's just kind of still there. I didn't really think anything about it uh, until I started feeling some pain. And then, uh, you know, went to the doctor. One doctor sent me to another doctor. And then he uh, sent me to another doctor who said, yeah, testicular cancer, and need to get surgery, so... I had that happen, and it's like, it's not, as far as surgeries go, it's not so bad, but it's still like a slit in your abdomen, so no training, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so that happened probably about two months or so after I noticed the the lump myself. Yeah, and then, so I had the surgery, and then recovered from that, okay, and they checked my uh, levels again, and I, I it had spread to a lymph node, so chemo was the next step. So I had to do that for a few months so after that. Did you have um, the the impression that the surgery might just fix it all right there, or did they, did they tell you in advance that you're probably going to have some chemo as well? No, that news didn't come until after the surgery. I, I was put in the surgery room pretty quick. Okay. Uh, but I, I've, I've been told in many cases the surgery is all you need and the chemo is not usually required. And then you can just do the remove one of them and then uh, the one that's infected or whatever. And <clears throat> that's enough in many cases. And then you, all you have to do is recover from your little wound and uh, get follow-up treatments every so often, stuff like that. So then you had to go, um, so it's kind of a, a surprise that you were going to start doing chemo then, right? Right, yeah, 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 yeah. And after having been, you know, sort of like a one-two punch there, you know, the, the surgery was one thing, and then you think you're you're fixed, and then you're not really fixed, and the chemo was quite a bit worse than the, the surgery was, really. Uh, and that took about six months until I was finished with that. And no training, obviously. So, yeah, during the chemo, you get a little thing in your chest, like a little port. Okay. Because they're, constant, they're constantly injecting you with this substance, this chemo. And, uh, yeah, it's in your chest. And so you can't really use your arms. And any sort of, like, trauma to that little port in your chest would be, you know, a real problem. Yes, it would. So I could I couldn't even really, I couldn't lift even, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I could do legs, you know? But I couldn't do push-ups because it would, like, mess up the little tube that went 
into my chest, you know. So yeah, it was quite quite hassle. How often would you go in for chemo? Oh yes, the chemo schedule was uh, let's see, you go in. It's pretty it's pretty intense for testicular cancer. Uh, you go in every day for a week, five days, every day, all day, like an eight hour day. Okay. And you're just sitting there plugged in for eight hours for one week. And then you come in Monday, and then you come in the next Monday, and then that's one cycle. And then you do that three times. At least in my case, I'm sure it varies, you know, from person to person. Yeah. Maybe. But this is what they felt would be enough without doing too much, in my case anyway. So um, I know every case is different. How sick was this making you? Like, well, I never, I never threw up, but okay. it does do a lot of little things to you that you don't really, it just, it's like, you know, it's like a real blunt tool, chemo, you know, so yeah. it's not like a laser pinpointed thing. So it just carpet bombs the whole system, you know? So the things like my fingernails were weird and my hair obviously fell out and, uh, you know, I just... Uh, so if they, they prescribe you a, a steroid uh, to, to combat some of the effects of the chemo, and then they prescribe you uh, other medicines to counteract the steroid and stuff like that. Uh, so you wind up bloating up, and I gained a lot of weight, and plus not training, and it was just, yeah, quite, quite a malaise I was in for a while. But... uh Anyway, yeah. Well, uh, sorry, I'm not sure what else I should go. Yeah, with. you're good. Um, yeah, okay. I've, I've never been through chemo myself, but I mean, from what I've seen, is one of the most miserable things that a person could be asked to go through, as far as you know, trying to save your save your own life. But um, very hard times and and uh, very very difficult medicine to to deal with, and so that's. Um, it's different than like we've talked um, about today. Some knee knee surgeries and some some yeah. shoulder injuries, and things like that that people get. But this is different because at the end of the day, you're worried about whether you're going to live or not. Am I correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a it's a, it's always in your mind, and even still, I guess you know, I'm getting checkups all the time. Are you? I'm still always thinking. As soon as like that that date starts to creep up on me, and then I. I think, you know, I hope it's not somewhere else or, I don't know, something like that. And then that day comes and goes and I get to feel relief for another few months. It's a year now, actually, so I'm every year now. But, yeah, that thought was certainly in my mind. But testicular cancer has a pretty high, I wish I had numbers for you, but it has a very high uh, survival rate. It's very rarely is it deadly, and I was reassured of that. Yeah, but over there's a reason. By, you know, doctors and loved ones. Yeah. But still, the cancer word is a big, it's got a lot of, you know, emotion attached yeah. to it. But, uh, you know, there is a reason why they, they, when they found out about it, you had surgery shortly after that, right? Like, they, they, didn't, uh-huh. want, well, they didn't want this in your body anymore. Um, yeah, it's a very, it's like a really aggressive kind of cancer, which is why I guess it happens to young people, because it uh, develops so quickly in your body so it'll happen to a young person rather than an older person let's let's talk and go ahead uh, i just want to talk a little bit about um you know some awareness of of uh, testicular cancer um yes yes. what's the typical age group that that it falls inside of typically i mean Um, wider range without really knowing exactly i know it's it's yeah, men, obviously, young men, uh, I would say something like 18 to 25. Okay. And I, I found out about it in myself when I was, was I 25, maybe, at the time. I'm 30 now. Uh, yeah, something like maybe 26, and, um, which is on the tail end of things. Uh, but I think it can still happen into the 30s. But, yeah, that's like the prime, that's the prime time is yeah. uh, late teens into the 20s. And you said you noticed a lump on your testicle. Is there? Um, right. So, I mean, we should just say this out right now. If, if you're a guy between the ages of basically any age, and you find a lump on your testicle, uh, it's a big deal. 
right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's something you should see your doctor about. And yeah. I'll say there's some characteristics of it too. Like it's, uh, it's not, it wasn't mushy. It was hard. I could tell it was hard, you know, so that's okay. another characteristic of it, I believe. And you know, it won't, it won't go away. Right. And so another thing that I didn't really have, except just, like, vague memories of what I thought my testicle was supposed to feel like. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, I didn't really have a good baseline to know what change was, really. So, for the first while, I just felt it, and I was like, is this, maybe it's always been there, and I never noticed it, you know? You tell yourself these kinds of things. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know, at a certain point, it was really the pain of it is what made me come in. If, If it didn't hurt, I don't know. I might not have come in for another, who knows how long, you know? Yeah, and, and how and, long uh, it was spread. Conversely, I guess, if I had uh, if I had been more aware and I knew this was abnormal from the get-go, I might not have had to go through the chemo thing, and I could have just done the, done the surgery thing and it been okay. Yeah, I think a, a lot of, uh, nobody likes to go to the doctor. I mean, and, and right, something right. like that, it's it's even more intimidating, and it's, I think it's a common feeling to to just want it to go away. You you know, I'll I'll wait a little while and I hope it goes away. I'll, yeah. You know, and and, yeah. and just because that I mean, really in jujitsu we get hurt all the time, and it and it does usually just go away. You know, I'll have my yeah. elbow sore for a little while and it goes away, and then my back is sore and then it goes away. But something like this, <laughs> but by by waiting, it it yeah, like you said, you might not have had to do the chemo. That might be time you get back of your own life that you didn't have to be you know so miserable and uncomfortable and and have yeah. that, that that line in your chest <clears throat> so are there any other symptoms that we should talk about as far as uh, other people that maybe you didn't experience but you've heard about that that are common uh, you mentioned a lump and some pain um those probably yeah aren't... supposedly uh pain is an uncommon symptom is what it, uh, i was told by a physician who told me that pain was rare okay that's good uh, to get out there with cancer so uh, yeah I, so I guess the moral of that, I mean, don't think that just because it doesn't hurt means it's not potentially life-threatening, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. I think that's what I really needed was like, I don't know. I never really had this talk in health class, you know? Yeah. This like monitor the size of your testicle talk, you know? No one gave me that talk. <laughs> yeah. So. It's the, um, yeah, anyway. it's, it's the overall, like the, the overall size or like a lump on the side of it or. Or both potentially, or no? It was a, it was just a, it was an obvious little growth on the okay. side. For me, anyway, it did. It wasn't like the whole thing was. It was more, I guess, let's say shape the shape of it rather than the size of it. There was just like a, yeah, I don't know. It was hard lump. Okay, you know, on the side of it. Yeah. So yeah, it, yeah. basically, um, what you would recommend is what I'm gathering is to to get like a baseline. Um, and I, and I think they recommend uh, checking yourself in the shower, um, yeah, and and just kind of see see what's going on down there. And that way, mm-hmm. you, you know, every I don't know how often they recommend doing this, but when something changes, you you catch it quicker because, like I said, usually it doesn't involve pain, and you notice the difference because this is unusual for me. I mean, like this this wasn't there last time I checked a couple weeks ago. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, yeah. I wish I had been more aware. Yeah, of my body for sure. Okay. Uh, w- one other thing about about the whole uh, chemo thing that I, I wanted to mention uh, was, and, and also the surgery too. I guess I, I remember being really worried about like it affecting my, you know, level of testosterone or something. Sure. And yeah. like maybe I won't be this like, you know. You know, a vibrant, athletic jujitsu guy, yeah. and you know, I, it would affect my game somehow or something like that. It seems stupid to be concerned with like how my jujitsu game's going to be, but I don't know. I found a way to worry about it. Have, but uh, I haven't really, I haven't noticed anything. No, no doctors have ever told me that that's the case. You know, your just your other testicle makes up for the lack of testosterone produced. By the other one that's missing, things okay. like that. That's what I was going to um, get at you. Like, are there any uh, lasting oh, yeah. effects that you've noticed? Um, so, not no problem. Um, you're not having any problem with the testosterone and none. So, and well, I haven't actually had levels checked, I guess. But just just uh, the way I feel. Yeah, I would say 
is no no different than any than than before. You know, uh, you know my hair, you know, was a little different for a while. And oh man, one during training actually, uh, my fingernail fell off, and that was one of the most painful parts of this whole thing. Was uh, yeah, my fingernails are really weak, and I, I rushed back into training after chemo and lost a thumbnail. It was pretty pretty gross. <laughs> but, uh, Oh yeah, another thing about side effects of the uh, chemo uh, sterility, I guess, is is a concern. You know, it, it making you infertile, and uh, okay. that's I, I'm about to have kids right now. Actually, my wife's pregnant. Oh, kids, congratulations! So that's, that's not a thing either, really. You know, I think Lance Armstrong maybe had kids after naturally. I think as well. Maybe I don't know, but maybe Tom Green. I think he's had kids since. Yeah. So it's it it's a possibility that it could affect it, but not not uh, a sure yeah thing. right yeah they tell they tell you that it might, but all I've heard are stories that were positive you know well, good. That's not terribly that's not terribly scientific but it's uh it's something anyway yeah um if you had a, a friend of yours that that just found out you know whether they're in jiu jitsu or not um that they that they have testicular cancer and it's a, a similar stage that yours was in. What would you tell them for uh, to help get them through that? Well, I'd like to reassure them that it's not it's not a death sentence by any means. You know, it's it's very high survival rate, and it's something that's that's temporary. And once once you get past it a little bit, you'll be able to see that it was just a, a moment in time of your life. Yeah, and it, and it's not it's not your life. You know what I mean? It's a thing that you went through. It's not a it doesn't define you. Defining characteristic of what what you are or what you're going to be or what you can be or things like that. You know, uh, yeah, it's just another it's another obstacle to overcome. And I guess jujitsu certainly taught me about that kind of thing. How did, was jujitsu at all? Um, like the mental aspects of jujitsu, that help you get through it, or was your team? Um, yeah, it's really it's hard this. to say. I'd say, uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I think the more uh, concrete answer I can give you is that having having my team around was nice. You know, that's that's just an instant social group. And people use the word uh, family sometimes to describe your team, you know. You've probably heard people talk like that. Maybe it's a little yeah. strong in some cases, but it's... You know, it's not completely inappropriate, I think, to say that kind of thing, because, uh, I don't know, I, I found people very generous and very, very giving and with their time and things like that, and uh, it was it was quite helpful. As far as the mental the mental side of it, getting anything from jiu-jitsu, I don't know, that's probably harder to, to quantify, but yeah. I, I'll say this much, it gave me something to uh, anticipate on the other side of the whole thing, so I was like, really chomping at the bit to uh to to get done with this and put it behind me so i could get on with my life which includes jujitsu in a big way yeah so that was that was a big deal oh and you know another thing maybe physically too uh just having been in in decent enough shape i guess that my body could withstand chemo maybe better than someone who was didn't have a hobby that included you know Showing people around it. Yeah, absolutely. You, I mean, going into that um, in in good shape is gonna is gonna really help you. I mean, it's still gonna gonna kick your butt, but it's way way better to go into that in shape than than out of shape. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. You know, th- I mean, this is a, a an emotional story you, you share with us because it's. I mean. There's there's fear involved. There's there's anxiety, and I mean, it's, it, I, I'm just trying to put myself in your place, and I can't really do that because I haven't ever experienced this. But um, if if a teammate of mine is in your situation, you you mentioned the team was there for you. Um, you know, is, are we talking about what was what was nice for you? Did you, like a phone call or a text throughout the day while you're while you're doing chemo? Did people come up and say hi, or or what would what would be a good way to treat a teammate who's going through this this kind of hard time? Well, you know, anything really, and uh, be it a text or, or coming coming by, you know, you could find out 
where the person is and visit them because it can be a long day in there. I don't know, you know, different people respond to adversity in different ways, and they seem people seem to withdraw some. And yeah. I, I know I did, I, I certainly did, but just because I was withdrawing, and I, you know, like you don't want people to see you a certain way, you know? Yeah. I, I still. I still really valued all the people that came and did whatever, you know, said whatever, wrote some message somewhere, you know. Yeah. All the little thoughts were were, were still real important, even though, you know, maybe if someone asked me directly, should I should I come visit, you know, maybe I would say to them something like, nah, you know, I'm okay. You know, my mom's here or something. I don't need anything else. You know, something like this. But at at the end of the day, it was all it was all good to, to hear and see. Yeah. Um, d- just a, a little side note from my experience: if um, sure. if if you have a friend in the hospital in a, in a situation, whether it's cancer or anything like that, where someone's with them, like these, like like your mom is with you all day, um, you know, say I would like to come up there and say hi and hang out with you for a little while, and then that would give um, the person who's who's up there all day give them a break, you know, let them, I mean, it's hard yeah, for them to yeah, see yeah. that as well, you know, and someone they love is in, is in that situation, you know, say, Hey, I'm here. I'll be here for three hours. You know, you know, if you want to take off and, 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 and take your mind off of it and, and I'm going to hang out and we're going to try to have fun, you know, <laughs> just, just yeah, little things yeah, like yeah. that you could do for people uh, when they need it. Yeah, it yeah. makes a big difference. It's emotionally taxing for other people around too. Yeah. So yeah. It's good to, to have, you know, a good circle of people to draw from who can, you know, help pick up the slack when, you know, your your family or, or you know, I don't want to say getting tired of being around you, but, you know, it's it's not fun for anybody to be in there, you know, visitors or not. Yeah, it's it, yeah because um, if, if you've never experienced this sort of thing, um, if you're going on there as a friend or, or a family member for the first time to see this person in the hospital, um, from my experience, and I've, I've never had cancer, but I've, I've helped some family members with it, but... Um, your first time you see him, you know they cry because they don't want their their they feel like you know it's 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 a hard spot for them to be and they don't want you to see like that. And then you know the other person usually will cry because they don't want to see their friend like that. And it's just, I mean, expect it to be emotional for a little while, and then usually um, people come out of that, and then you get to spend time with your friend. I mean, it's, I mean, you realize how important yeah. things are, you know, as far as life goes, and and uh, yeah. So I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. And another thing too, you know, you can't really, you can't talk to your mom about jujitsu. You know, <laughs> that only goes so far. You know. Yeah, she's she's not. Right. I, I don't know about yours, but my mom's is got a terrible triangle joke. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah. You know, no matter how many times I tell her, you know, turn, turn the head. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't take. That's a good point. Well, I, you know, it's been a pleasure talking with you, and, and I really appreciate you sharing your story and. Um, I say it's been a pleasure. It's been um, good to talk with you. I guess it would be a better way to say that because um, hopefully we'll we'll help some people. And if you know if you're a guy in a situation where you found a lump, don't wait on it. It's not a not a, not a thing to put off. It's not a, a, a sore shoulder or a you know a bum leg. Um, you've got to you've got to get it taken care of uh, sooner the better, and it could save you a lot of. It could even save your life, or it could save you having to go through some chemo. So I really appreciate you getting on yeah. here and sharing your story with us and. And hopefully helping some yeah, people. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for the platform. Yep. All right. We'll keep up with you. Um, thanks for jumping on here. We appreciate you. Sure. Thank you. Hey, this is Byron here. Uh, just recently finished up the interview with our friend Tommy talking about testicular cancer. I've done a little research. They do uh, that pregnancy test um, just as a way to see, kind of just check things. That's not a thing you could do yourself. If you, if you find a lump or something like that, something's wrong with one of your testicles, getting a pregnancy test and seeing if you have cancer is not a way to do things. You need to go see a doctor. Um, and it does also provide false positives to make you, uh, you know, very worried for potentially no reason. So the proper response is to go to the doctor. They may give you one, but don't give yourself one and think that you could determine what you have or not. So it's not a, not a cancer test. It's a pregnancy test. Use it to find out if you're pregnant. So, <laughs> but it is a thing that they do. Um, so just thought I would throw that in there. Didn't want to have any confusing information. Thank you guys. All right, guys, I have Adam on the line with me, otherwise known as Big Red. How are you doing today, Adam? I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. 
Good. Um, we're happy to have you on the show and share your story. You've got an interesting situation <clears throat> where you injured your ACL, and then you had some uh, other things happen after that. Before we get started, Adam, I want to know a little bit about you, uh, where you're from, where you train at, and, and how long you've been training and stuff like that. Uh, well, uh, so my name is Adam Sacknock, also known as Big Red. I uh, train at 10 Plan in San Francisco. I'm a bound under Denny Prokopos. I've uh, been doing jiu-jitsu for around four years now. Um, before that, I did judo for a little bit under a year. Um, and I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a very competitive. Um, I've, uh, I first started competing in judo, and I did real well there. Um, and I hurt my ACL. And uh, that's why I decided to make the switch to jiu-jitsu. I just wanted to spend some more time on the ground. I kind of was nervous I was going to re-injure my knee uh, with pros and stuff like that. I actually, um, so my first major competition that I won was uh, the Blue Belt Nogi Worlds uh, IBJJF um, in 2010. And then in 2011, I took third at the Purple IBJJF uh, Worlds and then in 2012, I won uh, Gracie Nationals and Gracie Worlds at Purple Belt. I got my brown belt, and I did the ADCC trials, and I um, won that. And, um, you know, I ended up hurting my knee again, uh, getting ready for the tournament. Um, um, well, actually, I want to know, you, you just recently opened up your, uh, your own school there? Yeah, so I'm actually... Um, I'm finally recovered from my surgery. I'm back on the mat. I'm feeling good, feeling healthy, cleaning, teaching. So I'm actually opening my own school now. Um, it's probably like nine months after my surgery. I'm opening my own school. Uh, 10th Planet Sam at Hill. You can go to 10 planetsmcom uh, if you're interested for any of the details. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun right now. It's something, uh, you know, I just taught my first week's worth of classes and, uh, you know, things are going uh, real well, and I'm uh, really enjoying it. I'm just happy to be back up on that after well, all that time off. Well, cool. Congratulations on opening up your own school and, and getting back on the mat, sir. That's that's good. Uh, that's what we like to hear. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah. You know, I, I, I really appreciate the fact that I'm back on the mat now uh, just because I went through a really tough time with my surgery, and there was a point where I wasn't sure if I was going to, you know, be able to teach or train again. So, you know, I think that adds, that makes me a lot uh, more appreciative of, you know, being able to do what I love. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes you don't realize how important something is until you, you might not be able to do it forever. So- yeah, you know, it was, it was funny because, you know, um, I started teaching again before I was really able to roll and stuff like that. And, you know, people would complain to me that, you know, they couldn't train for like two or three days or like a week, you know, and it's kind of, it's kind of funny thinking back on, you know, that, that used to be me. I'd be like, oh my God, I can't train for a few days. But, you know, when you're not able to train for like almost a year at a time, you know, it really puts things into perspective. Absolutely. Can you, let's get into your injury a little bit there. What happened? So originally I was doing judo, um, and, you know, I was competing, and my goal was, uh, you know, I was, I was very ambitious. You know, I'm going to go to the Olympics, and I was training super hard. Um, I was training, and um, the guy was going for a throw, and instead of trying to throw me, he just fell on my leg and hyperextended it. And uh, I tore my ACL, and uh, I had some issues with my meniscus, too. Uh, it was like a minor tear. Uh, and I got an MRI. And, uh, they, you know, they all thought that I would need surgery at the time. Um, yeah. I didn't really like my first doctor because he was basically telling me that, you know, my grappling career was over. So I found another doctor. Um, and I just kept doing physical therapy. And, you know, I, I was really young at the time. I was probably like 19, 20 years old. And I was just responding really well to the physical therapy. And even though I didn't have an ACL, um, you know, I went to two different doctors and they both said that my knee had like seemed pretty stable and it wasn't hurting. So, you know, I, I did physical therapy for around eight or nine months and, um, I was back on the mats training again and without an ACL competing. Um, and I was able to compete for another, you know, five years, four years, uh, without an ACL and I did pretty well for myself. 
Um, but at the same time, it, it kind of took its toll on me. You know, it got to the point where I was, you know, and I was doing the trials and stuff like that. Um, I won the trials, and I wasn't really, at the time, I knew I was hurting my back, I was hurting before I actually won the trials, so I was training really light, and I wasn't really even expecting to win the trials, so after I won the trials, you know, I'm, like, watching all of these other, you know, professional guys, uh, you know, and they're, like, training super hard, doing all these strength and conditioning programs, and, you know, I was like, oh, I need to do that, so I started doing that, and, um, you know, I, my knee just couldn't take it. And uh, when I really tried to bump up my uh, my uh, training, my knee just kind of gave out on me. And it just got to the point where I was just limping around and I couldn't even work. And uh, I actually went down to HQ and I laid a train for a week. And uh, when I was down there, all I could do was, was train, you know. So, like, I would spend uh, the day icing in my hotel room and then I'd go out and, like, hobble over there and train and, you know, play guard and try and stay off money, and I came home and just ice, and that was really all I was doing. And when I got back, uh, you know, still a few months out, I was like, I don't think I can do this anymore. So, you know, I went and I got another MRI, uh, talked to the knee doctors, and so I guess my uh, my ACL tear obviously was still there. It was a chronic yeah. tear, and my meniscus had uh, gotten a lot worse. So, uh, you know, the doctors recommended surgery, told me not to, you know, compete and to stop training, um, you know, and even after that, I, I tried training a little bit uh, longer, but it, I, I, I just couldn't keep it up, and so, you know, I just ended up having the surgery, and, uh, you know, I kind of gave up. It was really tough for me because, uh, you know, when I first started doing jiu-jitsu, that was my entire, you know, goal. My entire dream was to go to ADCC and win and, you know, be the next big thing, and, uh you know, I really had to give up on that. And, uh, you know, that's still something that I regret. Um, you know, just, I mean, it's kind of tough when you get that close and, you know, you get a free plane ticket together yeah. trying to, to compete. You know, it's such a huge opportunity uh, that I really kind of had to throw away because of, you know, my health issues and stuff like that. Um, so anyways, you know, I, after surgery, I started, um, didn't even notice that my knee was hurting what was actually bothering me was my foot. So, you know, it's it's literally like a few hours after my surgery, and I'm not even talking about my knee. I'm saying how much my foot hurts. It feels like it's on fire. You know, I can't move it. Uh, you know, I was telling the doctors about it, and they said, you know, that could last up to a week, and it's normal. Uh, a week goes by. It's, it's just getting worse and stuff like that. So I ended up getting some nerve damage um, in, my, in my, you know, my sciatic nerve. Um, so basically, my entire left foot is, was just on fire, um, very tingly. You know, it kept me up at night uh, for four months. You know, and, and I was on crutches for four months, and that's really not normal in ACL surgery. So um, you know, it was really tough. I you know, they had me on all these heavy duty painkillers. I had to go see a pain management doctor. They had me on uh, you know a bunch of different drugs that you know people don't normally go on for. Uh, ACL surgery just because of the nerve stuff. So I was on a bunch of different meds. I was like super loopy and it was like the most depressed I'd ever yeah. been in my entire life. Um, and it was really tough, but, uh, you know, little by little, my nerve stuff started to feel a little bit better. Um, and it actually still bothers me right now. You know, it's like almost nine months later, but, you know, it's at a point where before it was unbearable and, you know, I was kind of like, I don't know if I can live with this. And now it's kind of at a point where it's just annoying. It's fine. I can live with it. It sucks, but it's just annoying. Um, and, you know, I'm just happy that I'm able to, you know, train and, and uh, like, go to sleep without being in excruciating pain anymore. Um, so, you know, little by little, it, it did get better. Um, you know, people were, were telling me, oh, you know, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. It just takes time. And they were right. But at the time, it's just so hard to hear that and to like think past the moment when you're in like such pain you know it's kind of hard to see past that but excruciating moment um yeah so it was just a real tough surgery but um my knees actually feeling a lot better i'm able to squat you know a lot deeper than i was before yeah um you know so it was a tough surgery, but, you know, I think I, I pulled through and I'm definitely over the worst of it now. Did, did and, they, um, 
you know, I'm, I'm hoping at some point the nerve stuff goes away completely and I can start uh, competing again. Do they and know there why? Was also, I'm sorry, what were you about to say? Oh, do, do they know why you got this, this nerve damage to your foot? I mean, so you said uh, it's not I'm very not common. sure if my doctors are trying to avoid getting sued. But according to my doctors, it was not because of the knee surgery. Um, and so here's the thing. In my mind, it could be because of a knee surgery. But at the same time, it can't. I can't just 100% believe that it's the knee surgery. Because I also actually have some back issues. I had uh, chronic back pain and stuff like that. And so when they were diagnosing the nerve damage, I actually ended up getting an MRI of my back. And so I, on my L5-S1, I have a protruding disc out to my left side, and it's making contact with the sciatic nerve. Um, so it, it, it could be because of my back stuff. And so it, it, it wouldn't necessarily have been because of the surgery, but it could have been because I was completely out on the operating table and the way my back was positioned, um, you know, or the way they were moving my legs, that affected my back and uh, just popped the disc out a little bit more. Um, and then there's also the fact that, you know, maybe it was just a combination of everything, you know, the surgery, the way I was positioned after surgery, um, you know, maybe it was the, uh, the, the knee brace that I was wearing, you know, a combination of all that stuff, my previous back issues, you know, just the, the trauma from the surgery created an inflammation in the nerve and then having the back issues and then, you know, them beating off of each other uh, and just getting to this point. And then also the fact that I couldn't walk on it and, you know, all of this, uh, like, so they're really, so basically for the longest time, I was really upset at my knee doctor and I blamed her for everything. And, uh, it was really hard to move past that. And, uh, for me right now, I'm kind of at a point where I don't know how it happened. And, you know, I could just blame it on her and I could sue her, but I don't really want to play that you know, victim role, I think getting them into that mentality makes it harder to heal, you know, because you kind of have to prove how terrible your life is and how much it's affecting you. And, you know, it, it is affecting me in ways. Um, but when you go down that route, it's really hard to stay positive. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just prefer to be like a, a decent person and make an honest living and, you know, not try and be a victim and just try and enjoy my life, you know? Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Like if you have to, to, explain how bad this is you know to a bunch of people and and that's going to put your your mental state in a negative uh, condition and, and and that's going to affect the way you actually feel i mean it can make you feel worse maybe and and exactly. like i said that's not how you want to live your life um playing the victim role you want to get past this you want to get back to doing what you want to do you want to get back on the mats and and accomplish your goals exactly so, i mean right now the nerve stuff it still bothers me yeah. um but at least it's at a point where I'm able to do what I love again and, you know, I'm not in excruciating pain. It's nagging and it's annoying, but, you know, so what? I mean, I, I, I kind of think that when you get to the higher levels, also in, in jiu-jitsu, um, you know, you probably can't find one guy that's like at a, that's a competitive brown or black belt that doesn't have some kind of chronic injury, you know, like kicks and crazy is like one of the greatest of all times and he can't even roll anymore he's so hurt and stuff like that i think this is also the reality of the situation is you know you kind of have to uh pay a price if you want to you know be one of the greats and, and get up there unfortunately you, yeah you said um you bumped up your training when you hurt your knee you trying to trying yeah, to do right things that other guys I are doing. My knee. what were you doing um, like training, was I'm just sorry. rolling more, just rolling harder, or were you were you doing like different things off the mat that you weren't used to doing? Or yeah, so I I got into a lot of uh, I like added a lot more strength and conditioning stuff, and just my body type and uh, you know the way like my my hips kind of rotate outward, my hamstrings are super tight, and so you know I think people you know because I'm a big dude, I'm 230 pounds, um, you know you know, and I'm also like I'm well established in the jiu jitsu community. So, um, you know, I'm working with these trainers and they just see that and then I'll see a guy that's like super hurt and maybe not the strongest at lifting weights and stuff like that. So I feel like um, people kind of would push me to do things that I probably wasn't physically supposed to be doing, you know, because I'm this big, tough, gifted guy. Um, and so I was doing a lot of like strength and conditioning 
doing squats and you know i get done and my knees would be hurting and i would be you know telling them like oh you know i need to find um and i don't think people really understood the situation it's like you know like look I, I don't have an ac out and um you know for me there was also just like some pressure you know because i'm going to like the biggest tournament in the world and uh you know i, I wanted to be on the same level as all those other guys um you know, because, you know, yeah, I go on YouTube and I'm looking at, uh, you know, the people I'm supposed to be competing against and I'm watching them do their workouts and stuff like that. And they're working like 10 times as hard as me. And it's like, man, you know, I got to bump it up. So there's a lot of pressure there. Um, I probably should have been training a lot safer. I might have actually still been able to do the tournament if I just took it a little bit easier, you know? Yeah. I, yeah, it's hard to tell what would, I mean, you, if you go back in time and do things differently, it, it hard to tell what would have happened but it's quite a interesting like w- with all the foot pain and, and and the the nerve damage it's is that which one's worse the i mean your knee is is it is it better now and then you're you still have a little bit yeah of foot man, my and... knee is feeling so much better feeling a million times better it doesn't really even bother me too much um to be honest like every once in a while it'll bother me but before like surgery it's it's definitely feeling a lot better than before the surgery my foot stuff is still uh it's kind of annoying you know it's crazy things that you wouldn't even think about right now uh i'm gonna pick up a sock my left foot or else you know like when you step on the mat with your foot and then you step off the mat and like your skin will kind of stick to the mat just a little bit as it, and like as it comes off and stuff like that will really bother me huh. you know if someone steps like on my foot and training, like you know, like my like face will go white for a second just because it's like so painful, or like you know, like sometimes like I like I have like a cat and like if I accidentally step on like a piece of cat food with my left foot, it just it's like hurts like ten times more than it should, and it's like you know ridiculous, but uh, I mean it is what it is, you know. Yeah, that sounds. I mean, we've all stepped on a Lego, and that that yeah. hurts. But I mean, cat food shouldn't hurt you if you stepped on it, and it. So you could tell it. I mean, there's something going on in there still that hopefully you're you're getting better as time goes. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's weird, you know. I have like a like usually if I'm like if I've trained a lot or I've done a lot throughout the day, like by the end of the day, like when I'm trying to like go to bed at like night, my foot like will just my left foot will be so much redder. Yeah. Than my my right foot, you know. Um, and I've I've talked about all of this with my. Uh, you know, doctors and stuff like that, and they say it's normal and it just takes time to heal. Um, and my my legs get in stronger. Um, oh so yeah, that was another thing. I still have a lot of atrophy, especially because my surgery was so much more difficult than most people. You know, most people are walking again, or you know, putting at least putting some weight on it after like a month after the surgery and stuff like that. So I have a lot of atrophy in my quads and my calf and stuff like that. And my quad strength has come back a lot. Well, my calf stuff is still very, uh, the calf's still very weak. It's it's getting stronger slowly, but uh, I think it's definitely more related to the nerve stuff. So, um, you know, it's been tough. But uh, you know, when I, it's the funny thing is, like, my foot stuff bothers me. Like when I'm walking or sitting down, trying to have a conversation with someone, like I'll be a little bit uncomfortable than normal. But like when I roll and stuff like that, I I still feel great, you know, because yeah. like like I said, you know, when you're rolling, it, it allows you to forget about your troubles and stuff like that. And you know, like when I'm in the middle of a roll, I'm like someone's stepping on my foot or, or you know, accidentally kicking my foot or grabbing it. I, I feel pretty good. Yeah, it does. It, our minds change when we're rolling, and and uh, we we notice things that are important to the roll, but not, it, you know, if it's if it's insignificant to the position or to the you know, what their hands doing or, you know, kind of ignore yeah. it, you know, if it's not going to affect your, the outcome of the grappling, it's, I mean, you've, you've been doing that for so long and it's like, uh, like pressure points don't really work on jujitsu because you've ignored that sort of pain and discomfort exactly. for so long. You have any, uh, like lasting effects to, to how you, how you're doing jujitsu now? Are you, are you having to play an d- entirely different game or are you able to do the same stuff you, you've always you done? Know, I actually feel like I've gotten so much more technical um, because of the surgery. Uh, I can hit the scape on my left foot. However, sometimes it's painful, and I prefer not to as much as possible. So I've been just playing a completely different game, uh, using a lot more stiff arms and stuff like that, uh, and like to 
recover and stuff like that versus, um, you know, hip escaping um, and just, like, controlling the head and stuff like that. And also I've been playing a lot less full guard because I'm just more aware of my back issues now um, and just slowing more, uh, taking it easy with people, you know, picking the right training partners, uh, training safe and, you know, I think before, like, whenever I was, like, rolling, like, you know, I, I just roll super hard and, you know, you roll the win and stuff like that. And I really eased out on that stuff. And, you know, I still tap people and stuff like that. But, you know, like, it's not the end of the world if you don't get the tap. And yeah, I'm just training a lot more relaxed, especially right now. Um, but, man, like, some things have just gotten so much better, especially because when I first started training, again, I was having a real hard time using my left leg. So I was just working a lot more on my defense from certain positions and, you know, just like, especially with like when I first came back on, like I would just, you know, have someone take my back and just try and defend the choke and stuff like that. And, you know, I just like, you know, so my defense has gotten a lot better. Um, yeah, I, I think my defense has actually gotten a lot better uh, just from having to deal with the surgery. Cool. Yeah. It's made you change the way you do things and, and it's made you expand your game and, and then, of course, that positional sparring, like you said about the defense. I mean, you at 100% healthy, you don't have to play a lot of defense, I'm guessing. Um, mm-hmm. you, you know, with the typical guys you, you roll with on a regular basis. Um, but but if you're putting yourself there and, 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 and working on the stuff you're not used to doing, it's going mean, to make anybody better than, the, than what they were. Yeah, exactly. If you had a, a friend that had a similar, let's go with your um, your early knee injury. What, would you, what advice would you give them the first time you hurt your knee if you had a friend with a similar thing? To really take it easy on the painkillers and uh, the, you know, the anti-anxiety, like, medications and stuff like that. Um, so, like, for my nerve stuff, I was pres- prescribed uh, colonitin, which is kind of like, you know, barbiturate, like the barbiturate family, kind of like Xanax and stuff like yeah. that. And, um, I was taking like, you know, and this was all under a doc- doctor's prescription and stuff like that. And I was taking that like three times a day. Um, and I was taking like oxy and morphine and stuff like that. And, you know, when I got off the oxy, it really wasn't that bad. You know, it sucks for a few days. Um, and that was it really. But when I got off of the, um, the quantitin, that was that was really intense. That wasn't just a few days. That was like months of hell of just feeling super depressed and like it was so like weird. Just because like you know like I was having trouble looking people in the eye. I was so nervous, uncomfortable, like coming off of it, um, and it was just a really tough experience, you know. And like so, if you don't need that stuff, you really shouldn't take it, you know. I think. You know, a lot of people will experiment with those kind of drugs. You know, like it, it might be fun when one of your buddy hands you a painkiller or hands you, you know, whatever, like you know, a barbiturate, and you have like one or two of those. But it's it, it stops becoming fun when it's a prescription and it's your medicine and you're dependent on it. And when you don't have it, you you feel so depressed and terrible, and it, it just takes forever to come off of it. And you know, you just want to feel like your normal self again. So I, I would just really recommend to, to take it easy. If you really need that stuff for pain, fine. But you really don't want to, you know, just because you're bored and you can't do anything, you shouldn't take a painkiller to have more fun that day. You know, you should really, I, I think that would just be one of my main things is take it easy on the drugs, you know, just because I think some people go a little crazy, you know, because it's like, oh, I'm hurt. I have an excuse. Like, I can just get fucked up um, all I want. And it's just, you know, like, you really got to be careful. You know, you're going to lose yourself. Yeah. Um, and then also, I will, you know, it's even though it's the truth, people just really aren't going to be able to see it. And it's like, you will, you, you may get depressed, but that will pass. You know, you're, you, you probably feel terrible. You know, you just had surgery. You're, you're probably hurting. You feel very vulnerable, very weak. And that stuff will pass as well. That stuff will get better with time. Um, and to, and I also, I think another thing to know to say regarding that kind of stuff is you will feel like everything I'm saying doesn't apply to you, but it does. You know, the, the time and, you know, the feeling better and all that stuff. You may like, oh, you know, like, 
that's just bullshit. That's just what everyone says. No, it's it's the truth, even though you you really don't. Because when when I was being told that, I like I didn't want to hear it. I didn't believe it. Um, but it, you know, it is the truth. You know, there's you know we have a lot of time to get better and yeah. stuff like that. You know, especially if you're young. You know, um, you know you're gonna get better. Yeah, and you and you have to you have to believe that too. Yeah, you mentioned earlier about. Um getting over you know these these drugs that will make you depressed and and or being in that state as well is hard on you uh mentally um that yeah. goes to say if you have a teammate that's going through something like this an occasional phone call could could be a, a real helpful thing to them just to say what's up and and touch base with them let them know how everybody's doing at the gym and, and encourage them that they'll, you know you you know you're halfway through your recovery period you know hang in there it really helped get your teammates lifted back up and and you know, they may not be in the gym every day, but they're probably thinking about it. So, I mean, that's a that's a, a good time to reach out to a teammate that might need some help. Yeah, you know, actually, now that you mentioned, I just wanted to um, actually, uh, you reminded me. Um, so, my coach, Danny Prokopos, yeah, um, he actually came to visit me at least once a week. He came to my house, even though he had a super busy schedule. He's coming to my house. They might have been coming to my house at least like two or three times, sometimes four times a week. Um, you know, he was he was he was also helping me out a little bit financially when I because I you know I was out of work and I was struggling to pay the bills, and he just really, really, really came through to me. And you know, that was one thing that I didn't have to worry about at all when I was going through my surgery. Like, if anything, the surgery just like reinforce the fact that I have this great support network. I have, you know, awesome friends, awesome family, like my family, my friends, they were so helpful and supportive through all of it. It was such a tough surgery, but you know, I I feel like one of the reasons why I was able to make it through uh, was just all of the support that I got from my, my family, my friends and, you know, my girlfriend and everyone was there for me. And it really did make a huge difference. Um, and, and not just my coach, you know, a lot of my other shifts and friends were coming by all the time, you know, calling me, you know, my family was always checking up on me. And, you know, that was one thing that I, that I remember. I was like, man, you know what? Like, I might not have my health right now. I might be hurting, but like, I've got a great family and my great friends. And, you know, I was just remember, I was just so appreciative of, you know, that everyone was really there for me. Cause that's, and there were a few friends that really didn't check up on me too well too much or anything like that and you know you you take note of that kind of stuff when you're when you're the worst you you've ever been and you feel terrible uh you're gonna take note of who's coming to see you when you're not at your and who's not coming to see you and you know that kind of stuff um it really does matter and you know absolutely yeah yeah that's i mean i've interviewed a lot of people about their injuries and stuff and having a, a good support network and, and many times that's the jiu-jitsu community that you, you're training with on a daily basis um, is, is a huge help to their overall recovery and the difference between, you know, finally getting off the couch and, and, and getting back into, you know, getting on the mat and getting back in the shape versus just not doing it anymore. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the people that you're, that you're with definitely affect your, um, your recovery. Definitely. Well, thanks, Big Red, for talking with us. We appreciate you sharing your story and and uh, in your. It sounds like you're well on your your way to full recovery. Um, hopefully, you get that numbness out of your foot. But uh, I think you'll be able to help some people. And then you know about the medicines and stuff and the drugs. That's a lot of people experience that, and they don't always want to talk about that or to share that. But you know, thanks for for doing that, and I'm sure you'll help a lot of people that that are going through a similar situation. Right on, man. Thank you so much for having me uh, and, you know, allowing me to share my story. I really appreciate it. All right, guys, we have John Hasse with us. He's going to share a few stories about getting over some injuries. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing awesome, guys. I appreciate you having me on. And we appreciate you taking some time out of your day here to talk to us and and help all uh, the BJJ community out with uh, tips on injuries. So thank you. Um, Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you train at and and, uh, who you train with or those sort of things? How long have you been training? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I've um, been training for a long time in various arts. I started in 2000 uh, with some Muay Thai and some, uh, you know, back then they just called it grappling. It was pretty much no gi jiu-jitsu. 
I uh, did that for a long time and basically I uh, had a midlife crisis two years ago when I turned uh, the ripe old age of 30 and I realized I had uh, no black belt around my waist or no sort of uh, significant rank. So I joined up with uh, Doug Frazier and T.J. Burke out of uh, Hanato Tavares Association, awesome. Guardian Mixed Martial Arts here in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And most recently I've uh, hooked up with... Uh, Second degree black belt uh, Tommy Wells, who's also with us, awesome, uh, Savarez yep. out of uh, Cleveland, Tennessee. That's good to hear. I'm I'm uh, brown belt under Hanato, so that's that's awesome. Oh, awesome! <clears throat> so, car- didn't mean to interrupt you. Carry on. <laughs> no, sir. I've, um, I've been training there for about the past. I've been in the association for approximately two and a half years. I'm really loving the gi. Um, sort of an MMA guy, my whole uh, my whole training career. Sort of a stand up guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, no gi guy, despised the gi, you know, could not stand it. I had one, and every time I put it on, I took it immediately off as, as soon as I got done training. As soon as we got done doing technique, I would take it off. But uh, about the past two and a half years, I really fell in love with it. And uh, it's really just opened my mind up and gave me a little bit different way to train as far as injuries go as well. I, I feel like the, the, the gi kind of limits uh, the speed and the explosiveness a little bit that sort of accumulates and helps accumulate injuries. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. If especially if you're dealing with somebody who's trying to go 100 miles an hour, you could definitely slow them down. That would make it less injury prone. Could you um, share with us some of your injuries that you've had? Uh, absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, I've had uh, two ACL reconstructions, uh, one MCL uh, reconstructions. I had uh, a few knee scopes, uh, two staph infections that required a what they call a pick line, which is basically a take-home IV that you administer your drugs intravenously, uh, your antibiotics. And uh, most recently, because of the knee injuries, I've, my pelvis has tilted a little bit, and I've developed an uh, L5 bulging disc. And I know a lot of guys in jiu-jitsu get those, and I know, uh, you know it's going to be a pretty common, pretty common thing, so that's why I'm kind of glad I'm on here to talk about how these things kind of relate to one another how the the knee injuries have given you the the l5 bulging disc yeah basically you've got a couple different options when you tear your acl um you can use you know a cadaver which is basically you know a dead person's ligament or you can choose to use uh, your own hamstring muscle and that's what i chose to use the recovery is much longer However, if you're going to continue to be a combat sports athlete or really any sort of athlete, um, it's better off to, to choose that. However, when I, unfortunately, when I did both my knees, it caused my pelvis to tilt. So I have a muscle loss in both of my hamstrings and, you know, injuries tighten up. So as those, uh, as those muscles tighten, it actually affected my back. And in jujitsu, you know, when you're playing guard, uh, I'm not really much of a, uh, spotter guard guy or anything like that but unfortunately everybody gets stacked you know i don't care how how good you are who you're training with how big you are everybody gets stacked at some point and that just sort of exacerbated uh that injury that i'm dealing with now and with that uh l5 herniation you have right now or bulging disc there what what symptoms are you feeling right now what do you have going on with yourself um actually when it first happened uh, I had complete numbness of my left leg. Uh, my my butt cheek felt like somebody shot me with a shotgun. I had no idea what was going on because I had a relatively light training session. So that's what, you know, some people probably need to realize is you're not going to be, you know, you might not be doing power cleans. You might not be getting, you know, getting stacked inside, you know, somebody stacking you from your guard. Um, I was basically throwing a Muay Thai switch kick. I mean, I was training with one of my students, a uh, beginner. We weren't even actually hitting pads. I was just doing a one-on-one-on, uh, just a partner drill. And after we got done training, I noticed you know, my butt cheek hurt really bad, and I had a lot of tingling down my leg. And a couple hours later, I had complete numbness in the whole leg, uh, no power, no no mobility, uh, I actually had to take about a week off of work, and the symptoms sort of alleviated uh, as I sort of went down the holistic path. You know, you're not, if you go to a general practitioner with something like that, they're going to want to medicate you. They're going to want to 
you know, well, let's take some x-rays and we're going to operate on you. But to me, that's sort of like putting a Band-Aid on cancer. I needed to really look at myself, uh, the way my pelvis was, the way my spine was. Everybody thinks their spine is straight. I'd say 95% of us, especially us stitchy guys, <laughs> our spines look like question marks. A lot of people don't even realize that or consider that. And we're putting ourselves in these precarious positions with stress in that position and people, you know, putting stress on our bodies. We're putting stress on our bodies to negate their stress. And um, so it's, that's kind of what happened, a long, uh, you know, sort of a long uh, long response to your answer there. And, uh, uh, John, you keep talking, uh, you talked about your holistic approach. Like, you know, you said a doctor's going to medicate you. What, you know, with your holistic approach, how... how how have you been trying to help your your back and back uh, th- with that approach? I have a uh, a great chiropractor that lives about twenty miles down the road from me. Um, he has a uh, about a six month, eight month. Um, he had a six or eight month venture in jujitsu and decided it wasn't for him. So he, but he understands the way that the body uh, can be torqued in the certain positions. You know, that can be rough, especially on our lower backs. Uh, you know, these guys, uh, I watched the Meow Brothers, and God bless. I just, those guys are going to, they're going to be crippled before it's all over. They just let people do whatever they yeah. want to. You know, if, if you want to put their ankles to their ears, they will let you do that. And I just think that's such a horrible thing for, especially these young guys, to pick up. But So basically what I do is I go to the chiropractor uh, about twice a week. Uh, sometimes once a week, depending on my work schedule and things of that nature. Um, and you need to find a chiropractor that not only works on your lower back, but looks at your entire body. Uh, this particular gentleman, he will grab the back of my knee and actually pinch a muscle, and it will hurt extremely bad. And two seconds later, uh, he'll do a strength test before and after, and it will make my leg actually stronger. So there's little things that he knows that other chiropractors don't know. Shout out to Chad McDill, by the way, in Trenton, Georgia. Big up to Chad. He's awesome. So I do the chiropractor twice a week. I also do, a, before I train, I do foam rolling. I want to do about 8 to 10 minutes of foam rolling. And I like to build up a lot of sweat. And uh, afterwards, I foam roll as well. And one of the biggest things, guys, I personally think is, an inversion table. You know, you can get these things at Walmart. You can get on Craigslist. People buy them, and they think it's, oh, I'm going to do sit-ups on this thing, and it's super hard, and then they sell it. So that's pretty, that's pretty much how I got mine. Some guy was like, yeah, man, I'm going to do inverted sit-ups. And he, did, he probably had it for a day and realized how horrible that was and how difficult that was. And so now I, and I try to do that. And um, to me, those are three things right there that – really help out a lot the chiropractor the foam roller and uh and also the inversion table getting some decompression because basically i think that most 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 cases from what i've been told and from what i've seen it's a compression issue for most people so th- those things are definitely helping me out right now i got back to competing actually last year after about uh probably about a four-year hiatus so, oh that's awesome uh, if, I, if i didn't do those things i don't think i would have been able to do that and then, uh, John, you also mentioned about uh, uh, two major staph infections where you had the pick line. Uh, can you explain, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, that? Yeah, basically, um, to me, this was the most horrendous um, injury that I've had. Uh, it happened on two separate occasions, and what's unique about it is it happened in conjunction with my ACL surgeries twice. So imagine... Okay, you've got an ACL surgery on your right leg. Okay, you're going to be out of commission for a while. You've got to rebuild your right leg. You realize that. After a while, you mentally accept it, and you're like, okay, I'm going to do the surgery. I'm going to rehab. I know what to expect. Well, what happened to me was after a few uh, few weeks after I started rehabbing and kind of feeling decent, I developed a staph infection. I didn't really understand why. I still don't to this day. But what they did was they, they put a, a pick line in uh, your opposite arm. So let's say my right leg is injured or, you know, post-surgery, and now they're uh, putting a uh, IV in your left arm. So 50% of your limbs are pretty much useless. And that goes on for approximately six, maybe even ten weeks, depending on how your body uh, reacts to the antibiotics. So you're shooting yourself up. 
uh, with antibiotics twice a day, um, every 12 hours. You can't lift anything over five pounds with that arm, so it's, you know, like I said, it's pretty much useless. And then, uh, you know, my leg at the same time, you know, just was post a, a major ACL surgery. So that happened, and then <laughs> three years later, the exact same thing happened again on my left leg and my right arm. So that um, really tested my my uh, mental toughness and my intestinal fortitude and how much I really wanted to learn, you know, martial arts and be a martial artist. It kind of kind of made me question my identity the second go around. So um, if I have any advice to anyone, I would say you know, try to use as much defense soap as you can prior. Uh, I had another surgery later on that was uh, just a scope. I didn't get a staph infection, and I believe the reason why is because I was actually using defense soap uh, religiously at the time, uh, about a month or two before surgery, and then obviously after. And I think that that helped out a lot because I didn't get, I didn't have a staph infection the last time, which actually surprised me. And I've heard a, heard a lot of people, you know, talk about that defense soap that has really done wonders for them, especially people who've had staph infections or ringworm, and it's uh, done wonders for them. So. As, you know, shout out to Defense Soap right there. Yeah, definitely. How much longer did your were you off the mat because of the staph infection versus just the the knee surgery? The staph infection was about six weeks for me uh, per arm, and it drove me nuts. So I, as soon as they took the, it's a big line. It actually goes from your lower bicep, if you look at your bicep, you know, some guys that lift are maybe a little bit leaner can see a vein. Uh, there's two veins near your bicep, and one of those veins goes towards your heart. And uh, basically what they do is they put a, a line in there, and it goes directly to your heart. So you're pumping antibiotics straight to your heart. So like I said, you can't do anything. You can't lift anything over five pounds. Uh, and basically that took me out for six weeks, and then you can't lift or do anything a week after uh, they take the line out. So I'd say seven, eight weeks total uh, per arm, you know. Do you have any lasting side effects with any of these injuries you've had? Um, I I have my bad days. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm 32 years old and I've had a lot of injuries. And, you know, my parents, uh, every time something happens, you know, they tell me I should have, should have been, you know, I should pick up a guitar or start playing drums again or something like that. But um, I just, I'm just addicted to it and I can't stop. But basically, every now and then, with how much scar tissue I have on my knees, I, every now and then I'll have a bad day, and my mobility is not what it once was. However, I'm working on that right now. I'm, you know, going on MobilityWide.com and you know, trying to look up as many things as I can to kind of build up mobility. That's kind of been my new thing the past few months. Uh, but that's probably been the biggest thing is just the flexibility in my knees. I don't think I've lost any. I definitely haven't lost any strength. I haven't lost really any size. But um, it can it, it can take a long time to build yourself back up. And I think that a lot of guys, once they get, you know, guys like like myself, I'm you know I'm not a, I'm not a professional athlete. You know, I work a full time job. Unfortunately, I'm actually uh, here right now. Um, so it. It takes a while to get over stuff like that, and for me, I could have easily, you know, given up and went down a different path. But be prepared for any of those injuries that I've listed. Be prepared for the worst. Be prepared for a year off the mats. I've had to do, you know, a year, year and a half off the mats, where all I could do was, you know, do kickboxing, and that's basically it. There's been times where I didn't get on the mat, I guess, for a very long time. Sounds like a rough year. It's it's, it's hard to to take time and to heal your body properly but it's it's important to do that and listen to listen to your body and and, and what it's telling you <clears throat> I want to ask you if you had a friend in a similar situation but you've had multiple situations so um, let's just start off with the with the with the knees if you had a friend that was having was going to go in and have uh, their knee taken care of like you did what would you talk what would you tell them as far as advice I would tell yeah, I would tell them to just, I think for me, and I think a lot of, you know, uh, uh, just Americans, uh, some of us are a little mentally weak. Um, you know, I was a, I played football for 10 years before I played, before I got into jiu-jitsu. I was an all-state football player. I thought I was really tough. 
Um, it turns out I really wasn't. When I got into jujitsu, I found that out relatively quickly. But I would tell them to just mentally prepare yourself. Uh, mentally prepare yourself for being completely useless for five or six months. Now, these guys watch these countdown shows, and they'll see George St. Pierre, you know, <laughs> Oh, he's two months out of surgery, and look at him. He's standing one leg on a BOSU ball, and he's got a weight vest on, and somebody's throwing a tennis ball at him, and he's catching that with his left hand. And, dude, those guys are probably on so much stuff, it's ridiculous. And I'm not making any accusations, obviously, or anything like that. But um, even if they're not on anything, they have a huge team of physical therapists and things like that. So I would, I would say, you know, mentally prepare yourself, and then physically um, do the lifts that you can do. Uh, if you can only do a leg extension, only do a leg extension. Obviously, the compound lifts like the squat, the deadlift, even bodyweight squats or a kettlebell swing uh, is going to help you out a lot because you're going to be doing the compound movement of your quad and your hamstring at the same time. However, if you're debilitated and you can only do a leg extension or you can only do a leg curl, do as much as you possibly can because your muscles deteriorate so quickly when you don't use them. And I didn't realize that. Uh, until after my first surgery, I take my cast off, and my calf looks like my forearm. <laughs> and I had no idea that, you know, in like two or three weeks that that happened. So I would say build up as much muscle mass as you can possibly do. Uh, don't worry. Obviously, don't worry about your weight class, gaining weight. You don't want to gain fat. But, you know, just lift as much and get as strong and get as much muscle on your legs as you possibly can. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who is facing a staph infection and in, in, in looking at that recovery? pretty much the same thing i mean mentally prepare yourself to be useless you you uh someone like me i i use martial arts um as a tool as much as a hobby um i have to let my aggression out um my fiance and i joke and we call myself you know the caveman she calls me i'm you know 170 pounds she calls me mini hulk because i'll freak out and you know, I, I have a short temper and i know a lot of guys that train do and it really mellows us out a lot so it's a mental thing for me as much as it is fun you know if i don't get that training in it really bothers me so that, that that's sort of a mental obstacle that i believe a lot of hardcore or regular martial artists whether you're professional or you know hobbyists like myself it's very important to just realize where you're at in that stage of your life and i've seen uh, i've seen a kid on facebook the other day i'm not going to mention his name but he was a few weeks out <coughs> of a few weeks post-op on his ACL. And he's standing in place, and he's punching mitts. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, okay, man, you're not making, what are you really getting done right now? You're standing in place, and you're throwing one-twos. What you should be doing with your time is working on your mobility with your knee and focusing on not even being a fighter, but just being a real person, because it made me feel like I was in prison because I couldn't enjoy my life. So, again, mentally, be mentally prepared to not train, to not be that guy that you've been for months, years, decades, whatever. You're going to have to be, you know, worthless for a few weeks, and you're just going to have to get over it and accept it. Yeah, that's definitely great advice. Uh, I think most people think about, you know, hey, I'm going to go through the pain, I'm going to go through this and that, but... You're right. I, I I haven't really been out, you know, with a major injury for a long time. But I I bet I'd never even would have thought of that that mental part of being down because we're so used to training and all of a sudden we can't do anything and it's a uh, you know you got to get that part straight. Yeah, that was the biggest struggle for me. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a fairly athletic guy. You know, give me a few months in the weight room and I can put the muscle back on. Give me a few months on the mat and I can get my you know my muscle memory back but just to sit there and you know especially if you if you're really so debilitated you can't go to work and you, you're sitting there in front of the tv and you know the ufc is on 24 7 now so you're sitting there watching these guys and you're shrinking you know and a lot of like myself i'm a i have a weightlifting background so a lot of uh, a lot of guys like myself oh i'm shrinking i'm just sitting here my muscles are getting smaller and it's it's really tough man yeah definitely you mentioned have, that you have your own gym. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. Um, I started teaching back in uh, 2004 when I was in college. Uh, just a little bit of some no-gi jiu-jitsu. And basically, I have a, now a private facility 
Uh, the reason I do a private facility is because of my work schedule. Um, I have a really crazy schedule. It's hard to say, okay, guys, we're going to train every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I basically have a, uh, a private facility. I mostly train police officers right now, and there's a few civilians, and I've got some military guys also. Uh, it's called the Fight Lab. It's located in uh, South Pittsburgh, Tennessee, which is approximately 30 miles west of Chattanooga. Uh, we've got a Facebook page, The Fight Lab. You can get on there. Um, we try to post the schedules and try to post the uh, the techniques that we do every class. I sort of have a big opinion about sort of where jiu-jitsu is going right now. So, you know, we do a lot of takedowns, do a lot of wrestling. Uh, we try to incorporate the self-defense. And we're obviously doing Muay Thai and a little bit of uh, combat submission wrestling, Eric Paulson system down there as well. So we get a little bit of everything, but right now um, most of the classes are jiu-jitsu and judo-based. Cool. Well, definitely look them up if you're in the area and you want to want to do some, some good training. Yep, definitely. Check out the Fight Lab, uh, South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. Thanks for jumping on here with us and sharing your stories. I, I'm sure you've uh, helped some people today. I really appreciate you guys having me on. I, like I said, I sort of have a unique situation. It's sad, but I'm still training. I'm still winning tournaments. So, uh, you know, as long as I'm mentally strong, I'm still going to be here. That's, that's awesome. perfect. Yep, that's awesome, John. Thanks for jumping on here, buddy. Thank you very much, guys. All right, guys, we have Michael Crampin on the phone today. How are you doing today, Michael? Pretty good. Good. Um, we appreciate you uh, taking your time here this afternoon and uh, talking to us and uh, uh, letting everybody uh, share your story about your injuries. So thank you, Michael. Hey, thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about who you are, where you train, and, and, and you know any sort of background information that might be relevant or interesting. Yeah, um, I live in Southern California. I train at the Gracie Academy in Torrance. Um, I've been training for uh, about two years now. Um, actually, sorry, yeah, about, about, about two years. Um, and, yeah, I don't really have much of a background in other martial arts. I just kind of got into BJJ after watching MMA and that. Never been super um, into sports or anything, but I've really enjoyed it. And that um, all the way through. And yeah, in, injury wise, yeah, it was about third month of doing jits. Um, I, I wasn't even at the point where I was doing full on rolling. We were just drilling, and a guy did a rear takedown and tried to jump to side control. And I don't even know how he did it, but he landed elbow first into my rib. And it apparently broke my rib. I didn't even realize it at the time because I had, I had to lay you know, like strain and obliques, I figured it was just aggravating that. Rolled on it the rest of the day, rolled on it the next day, and then I was in, like, eye splitting pain all that night, couldn't sleep. Um, had a friend who was a corpsman check, and he's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's broken. Ended up going to the emergency room, getting x-rayed, and, you know, you could see it on the x-ray that there's, the ribs just didn't line up. And, yeah, so that was kind of lousy. It was especially weird because I'm fairly small. only weigh about 140, and the guy I was rolling with about the same size. So it wasn't some, you know, huge guy falling on me. It was, you know, a lightweight, and he just landed absolutely perfectly elbow first into the rib and popped it and ended up being out for about two months. And I think I actually went that back a little bit sooner than I should have because it was still a little bit tender. Someone really heavy was inside control that I didn't re- re-injure it, but... I probably should have stayed out longer. Um, and, yeah, and, yeah, and it's one of those injuries that you really can't do anything about. You can't really splint it. It's just, you know, wait for it to heal and make sure you don't accidentally have your lung collapse or get pneumonia in the process. So, you know, you have, the, you have this thing where you have to shove a pillow into your side and breathe in to fully inflate your lung every, like, hour or so, which the first few weeks is really painful. But other than that, it's just, you know, kind of sit there and wait and eventually be able to get back on the mat. So is that a common uh, treatment for somebody who broke a rib, do you believe? I, I've never heard of having to take – so you had to take a deep breath every about every hour or so? Yeah, it's basically because um, cause since it hurts to breathe on that side, you'll kind of – you'll just naturally take a little bit shallower breaths than you normally do. And because your lungs aren't fully inflated, you can end up having 
you know, pneumonia or other things happen in the lungs because they aren't getting fully inflated. So you need to do something to force yourself to fully fill your lung on that side. Um, so, yeah, um, I guess, you know, it used to be, you know, you, you have rib wraps and that, but apparently they don't do that anymore. And, yeah, it's just, you know, you just take painkillers and then, yeah, about every hour you, you know, yeah, you kind of pack a pillow or something into your side to give it a little bit of support and then you take as deep a breath as you can to make sure that you're fully inflating the lung and that it's giving kind of like support so that the rib is inflating in place rather than puncturing it. It might be different if you had, you know, something with a floating rib. I'm sure that's handled differently. But for that, that was, you know, pretty much the only thing was being a painkiller. I said, yeah, make sure you do this deep breathing thing. And, yeah, eventually it got better. And it's, it's fortunately one of those things that once it's fully healed, it's pretty much 100%. You don't have to worry about it. So, I'm, so yeah, I went back. It was a little bit tender because I think, yeah, I went back a little bit earlier than I should have. But, you know, within about three, four months after the injury, I didn't feel it at all. It was 100% no problems. Which which rib did you injure? Um, it was, I think it was about the third one from the bottom on the left side. Okay. So is that, I don't know, is that considered one of the floating ribs or is that, that's one of the attached? No, no, it wasn't, well, you know, it wasn't a floating rib. It was one of just the normal ribs. Okay. But I think floating ribs are significantly different and harder to deal with. So it's just one of the lower ribs on that side. And it was funny because literally, um, I, I could you know just touch it with like one finger, like right where it hit the, where it was, and that entire side of my body would light up in pain. So you you know once I realized what it was, it was really obvious what it was, and then yeah, it's just you know kind of you know try to breathe it, breathe into it, and just wait and for the body to heal itself. And Michael, when you were out, uh, you know rehabbing and and taking the painkillers and taking the deep breaths. Did you do any type of uh, watching videos or anything? You know, I know you probably couldn't train at all due to the head injury, but uh, did you try to keep in by watching videos or show up to class to watch or anything of that sort? Um, for for first about, like, three weeks, I still was still showing up to class because my wife was going, so I was taking her and just kind of sitting on the sidelines and watching. But... About, yeah, after about three weeks, she broke a finger um, doing a takedown. So oh, once boy. that was happening, we were both injured, so we just kind of stayed home. But, yeah, I was still kind of, you know, looking at some, looking at some stuff, w- watching a few videos and that. Um, and, yeah, just kind of eager to get get back. You know, it's well, one of those things, looking back, you know, yeah, looking back, it's like, oh, I totally could have, you know, done more, you know, reviewing that I did, but... I try, I try to do, do, do some stuff, but again, you know, I was only three three months in, so I was at a point that I didn't really know, like, what things I should really be focusing on so much, so I didn't have as much guidance there, you know, mentally of what I could work on, so I was just kind of waiting until, you know, I want to get back. Yeah, and that's like you said, you're three months in, so you really didn't have as much experience where it's, you know, you don't really know what to work on or, or what to look at, but... Uh... Um, you know, I'm really surprised. Like you said, the, the night you did it, and you rolled uh, the next day, and everything. That's a uh, you're you're one tough guy. Uh, I think a lot of us had rib injuries, and uh, I know how painful that is to even just try to move your core, your hips, or anything. So, yeah, it was it was just a weird case because I I kind of like tweaked an oblique like the previous week doing weightlifting. So I figured, uh-huh. okay. So it was like I was. It was on. The, it was pain on the same side. I was like, okay, you know, I just aggravated that. No big deal. It's you know, just a slight strain. I'm not going to care about it. And then you know, that night it just completely lit up, and I couldn't get any sleep. And it was like, no, this is something way worse than just a little bit of a pulled muscle. And yeah, okay. and then at that point, yeah, I was literally like, you you touched it with one finger, and it just lit up in pain. And yeah, I said, what are my roommates in the core? And he's like, yeah, no, shit, that is broken, absolutely. And and I'm going to the emergency room, get it confirmed. Hopefully they could do anything, and it wasn't. And they were like, yeah, here, have some painkillers. Good luck. You'll be good in two months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like you had a good, uh, you know, roommate there, your, your corpsman there, definitely helped you out and give you some good advice. Um, and speaking of advice, you know, uh, you know, your, your roommate helped you out. What would you do uh, if one of your teammates, uh, you're training today and this happened, what, what advice would you give one of your teammates there to get through this injury? Yeah, I mean, the, the big thing is, I, I think definitely you want to do, like, the, the breathing exercises, especially, like, especially when they hurt a lot, but 
it, it definitely felt like it was it was making things better quickly, quicker, and by having you know kind of those, it, and it was keeping me from yeah taking the really shallow breaths and that which I think would have been really bad for my cardio when I got back if I hadn't been doing that in addition to the increased risk of infection and stuff. But yeah, it's really just kind of sit out and take it easy and. I mean, like with anything, don't go back too soon. Is that I think I went back a little sooner than I did because I definitely felt, you know, if I was wrong with someone larger, you know, if I had to get someone who was like 220 on top of me, I could feel that that side of my body was didn't feel as sturdy. Like it, it was a little bit of compression pain, you know, beyond what you normally get of just being discomfort. So, you know, it, it's supposed to be something, you know, two months, two and a half months before you go back. But, you know, I think err on the, the far side and, yeah, be, be careful and just kind of avoid playing bottom that much, like, right after you go back. Because even when I was out, like, I could do some stuff of, like, solo drilling. Like, if I, you know, I was practicing, like, mount control or that, I could theoretically do that because there's no weight on me. But, you know, it's just so just kind of, you know, you can get back into it a little bit faster than you might suspect in some ways, but you need to be really careful that you're not doing anything that's going to be putting weight on that side of your body. Do you have any lasting effect of your uh, injury there? Fortunately, absolutely none. I mean, other than, you know, missing out on a couple months, which, you know, it's like, ah, I, 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 you know, I'd be two months better now. I Absolutely nothing. It was, you know, it was maybe, you know, a month or so after I, I, I was back before, you know, there, there was, you know, no difference on someone being on top on that side or the other one. But other than that, abs- absolutely not nothing my rib feels fine. I mean, I didn't get a post X-ray or anything, but I'm sure it, it still looks fine. It's, it's fortunately one of those injuries that, unlike you know, like a torn ligament or whatever, it, it tends to come back 100 percent and you're good. So, as, as injuries go, it, it's probably one of the better ones to get just for that because you're not going to have lasting reoccurring pain or anything off of it. Yeah, and that's a great thing. You know, you're no reoccurring pain, and you're back to training at the the world famous uh, Gracie Academy there in Torrance. So uh, uh, that's awesome that everything is uh, working out perfect for you now. Yep. Yep. And we do definitely want to uh, thank you for uh, taking some time out here today, Michael, and and sharing your stories. It's you know sharing your story. I know it's definitely going to help uh, you know some of the uh, BJJ brotherhood there across uh, across the world there who, who's had some rib injuries and uh, and we really appreciate the tips and advice. Yeah, and the only other tip I like for is from kind of the other side of kind of avoiding it. I mean, pers- I, it's one of the things from the bottom. I don't think there's much you can do. They said it's and you know talking it doesn't seem a very common one, but it seems to be like you know, and for my case especially it was I got hit you know with his entire weight coming through the elbow. So it's one of the things like when, you know when you're trying to you know get on top of someone be a little bit of a, aware of that t- sort of thing because if you land, you know, a splash on someone, it, you know, knocks the wind out of you, but it's probably not going to cause an injury. Yeah. It's just kind of that little point. And so I, I still can't quite wrap my head around exactly how he did it because it's such a non-standard way to come up on top, but it's something to consider that, you know, something that you, you consider, you know, so normally, you know, really aggressively get into, getting into that side control position in a scramble of... You know, make sure that, you know, you don't have, you know, you're not landing that, that elbow first. Unless it's an MMA contest, and, and then in which case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you said, uh, the whole body weight coming down on that elbow, you know, so depending on how much that guy weighs, you know, it's it's going to be heavier in his body weight when it comes down to you, and it's just that little elbow point hitting right smack on your rib, the third rib up. You know, that's a recipe for disaster right there. Yeah, and, and it's not like, as I said, the, the guy who injured me weighed maybe 150, 160 on the outside. And, I mean, I've rolled with people up to 300 without injury. Yeah. And, you know, and, and this is the guy that does it. So, you know, it's, you always think, oh, you know, the big guy's going to be like, no, it's the guy that was, you know, my size, lightweight, and it's just, he just landed perfectly. Yeah. And, you know, and smaller guys, we have those really bony elbows, so we're a little bit more risk on that than we've got pointy bits. That just, that does show you the the power of like if he were to lay on that elbow on you, then you would get the true his actual weight, his hundred and would you say forty pounds. But as he's falling um, and building speed, that almost increases his weight. I mean, it definitely increases the impact of it. So he, I mean, he hit you um, 
you know, with a falling well, mass. More than, yeah. yeah, with a hundred more than 150 pounds of you know impact when when it did hit you. Yeah, no, I said it was just it was one of those just perfect storms yeah. of just a weird occurrences. But it's you know, so those things to consider because yeah, I mean, I for, for in that situation, like I could have had had a similar injury theoretically from someone you know, you know. You know, a, a kid or you know, a girl or whatever weighed 130 pounds. It just they landed perfectly, with, you know, the elbow point, which is where you figure, oh, you know, I can kind of take it easy there. Whereas, you know, you think, oh, you know, 250 pound guy, that one is the one I have to worry about falling on me. In my case, it was completely the reverse. Big guys have never had any issues other than you know the momentary discomfort, but it just yeah, landing perfectly and with with the, yeah, the elbow inside, which I, I think again, you know, we were both kind of new to it. And that, whereas a more advanced student wouldn't be in that position because yeah. it's not really a functional way to come down unless you're trying to cause an injury. But it is something to consider is that, yeah, it's not the size of who it is. It's, you know, there's, it's, it's what's actually landing on. If it's landing, you know, that elbow first or knee first, or that's what's going to cause damage, not just the raw weight. Yep, I think you're right. And you mentioned, you know, you, you both were new and you, you tried to figure out and recreate how it happened in your mind, and you can't. Well, that's because you both were new, and it probably was pretty. And it's probably pretty crazy about what would actually happen and what you guys are trying to do. They were probably a little different from each other. Yeah, yeah. so I thought it was just it's unfortunate. One of those weird thing. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for hopping on here with us and sharing your story. We appreciate it, Michael. Good. Right, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Uh, our next guest here uh, is Mike. He's also here from Wichita, Kansas. Uh, thanks for taking the time out and coming to speak to us today, Mike. Hey, sure thing. It's my pleasure. Uh, I'm glad to be been listening to the podcast for several weeks, and it's pretty cool to be able to have the chance to have something to say on it. So. Yep. Yeah, and, and you know, we appreciate you coming on. And uh, uh, you know, first of all, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, there, Mike. Sure. Uh, I've been training uh, mas- mainly just nogi uh, grappling for uh, well, I guess. Probably total time would be uh, maybe year a year and a half. Probably total time, um, basically just one day a week. The last uh, before my injury, which we'll get to, I'm sure. Before the injury, probably maybe twice a week for probably about three months or so before that. And uh, it's pretty exciting. I really didn't think uh, I would like it as much as I did getting started into it, but it, uh, it's fun. You know, anybody can do it, and uh, that's probably the most impressive part is meeting the people and the skill levels and just learning every time um but uh, never i tried gi once uh it's it's different style game i've noticed um but no gi i definitely prefer so that uh a little bit about me um i've done weightlifting i've done uh different you know tried running and stuff like that and other than other than weightlifting, I still do that, but this is definitely my favorite as far as other workouts. I don't run as much as anymore as I used to. Um, um, it's, it's fun. I enjoy it. And uh, Mike, tell us about your injury, like uh, uh, what happened, and you know, and how it happened. Sure. Uh, well, one one now after having gone through all this little journey, uh, I've noticed an, an issue that I had kind of gone into was uh, I tended to. Uh, power through a lot of things, especially defense-wise. You know, I'd get uh, caught in caught in a triangle, caught in a kimura or armbar or something, and I would try and use my power to kind of get through. Which, I mean, it would work, so I would continue to do it. And as far as how it came to here, is uh, it was one of those days. It was a great day. It was towards the end of the training session, and uh, just got caught in a really solid kimura, and uh, I had gotten really close uh, to getting out. And so I rolled. Well, as I kind of came up, it felt like I was getting out, and I should have. This is where I say I should have listened to my instinct. I should have tapped. I should have realized that uh, that was the end of it. I had tried, didn't work. Should have tapped there. And, and hindsight, you know, it's twenty twenty. But um, it felt like it, my arm wasn't quite secure, so I kind of did the whole power thing, went to explode and roll again. And just as I had done that. I felt my arm get secured, and I just knew in that moment this is going to hurt. And uh, my whole my arm stayed still, of course. My whole body went around, and uh, I heard something. I thought I heard a pop, um, and 
I was told later I screamed like a little girl. <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> I don't. I don't remember that part so much, but I'm sure I remember yelling or something. And then I remember just being on my back and just laying still and saw the pain, you know, was there, of course. And so I just just stopped. And my training partner, I was, we both stopped and kind of checked to see if I was okay. And uh, we thought I played football uh, in high school and dislocated my shoulder. So we thought I had thought that it was just. Oh, my shoulder just dislocated, but it felt like it went right back in. No problem. We'll get up and finish or, or go. And uh, but my arm had kind of gone numb for there for a moment. So uh, I had my partner kind of take my arm, and he kind of moved it for me. And it was moving. Uh, my shoulder felt sore, but it was okay. Um, but it it seemed like it was in. So we kind of like, well, you know, let's go ahead and stop for the day. And it was, like I said, in the training session. So we got up and... We kind of looked at my shoulder, made sure, you know, oh, it looks fine, looks level, everything looks good. I could raise my arm, uh, palm down up towards, you know, from me, but I couldn't bring it back. And then that's when we kind of realized, okay, there's at least probably a serious strain here. And uh, that's kind of what we were all thinking and hoping that it was at the time. How did you find Um, out it was a little more than a strain? Like, what had, you know, um, you went home and you probably rested it. Yeah, I, I would say that day I realized it was something serious because I was supposed to uh, I was supposed to actually move some furniture later, and uh, it it was hard enough getting you know changing my my gi shirt, uh, getting my hoodie on, getting out, getting in the car, all that, and then after showering and whatnot at home, uh, putting you know changing was very difficult, and then I said while I was at home I'm going to try and just move a little piece of furniture I had in my house my coffee table. And I couldn't move it. I just literally couldn't move it. And so I knew, okay, something's seriously wrong here. So uh, that's when I kind of uh, figured I'd just rest, got some help to do that. Um, and then in talking, I called a, I think it was, that, that happened on a Saturday. So I think it was probably Monday. It still wasn't feeling any better at all. I had been checking it. There had been no blood pooling, um, nothing like that. But it wasn't, it definitely hadn't gotten better. Uh, pain was still there, and so I called my training partner up, uh, talked with him. Uh, we talked to one of our training partners who was a paramedic, and he said something's seriously wrong there. You, there's either a tear or a very serious strain. Uh, you need to go get it checked out. And that was kind of the start of, okay, so yeah. I'm serious. And, so and then you go get it checked out by a regular doctor yeah. or orthopedic surgeon? or Yeah, yeah. Uh, thankfully, I kind of had a quick way in to visit an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, the day I was going to go see him, or the day before, rather, uh, all the blood pooling showed up in oh, my okay. body. So then I knew for sure, okay, something for sure tore. And uh, went and saw him. And the uh, the blood pooling had actually recessed a little bit by the time I went and saw him. And he was surprised it wasn't worse. But he did a couple little tests for me. And one of those tests was, uh, you know, putting your palm to palm in front of you as if, you know, like you're praying type of thing. And then just squeezing. Squeezing. And uh, I just couldn't do it, you know, not without any pain. And then he had me put my arms straight out, um, hard to describe, but just directly straight out in front of me, you know, palms inward but not touching, and then actually either raise, raising them up and then also bringing them in, and he put a little resistance on the inside of my hands. And uh, that hurt so That was terrible. brutal. Yeah. And he said he could tell from the, the shape of the pec uh, that what happened was is there's there's the clavicular head of the muscle and then there's the sternal head of the muscle and the, t- the tendon that connects the sternal head to the humerus, the bone, that's what was actually torn. So you actually tore your pec yeah. uh, in that, trying to roll out of that Kimura. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the good thing was, I guess, is it was a clean tear from the bone. It wasn't a, a muscle tear yeah. from itself because it's much harder to surgically repair those and heal those. Um, so the, the process for, at that time, he had told me, you know, of course, we're all worried about, well, when can I get back to training? When I, can I get back to this and that? What time am I looking at? And he said, well, he said, we need to get you scheduled for surgery. He said, but to double check, we're going to do, uh, do an MRI just to make sure that the tear is where he thinks it is. And uh, he said, if it is uh, as bad as we need to, he said, there's an option to not do the surgery. We always think about, oh, yeah. I, I don't want to get cut on. And... Uh, he told me, he's like, well, he said, you can certainly do that, but I'm going to tell you, you should do the surgery. 
He said, you could not do the surgery. It's still going to take you months to heal. He said, but you'll never, ever get back to where you were. Yeah. And it's always going to look deformed. You'll never be able to grow that part. Um, he said, if the, if the tear was different, that part of the muscle could have even died. Okay. Um, but he said it wasn't that. It didn't tear from the muscle, so it would it would have still worked. Um, but I would have never gotten my strength and power back. And Which, you, like you said, you were, you were really big into weightlifting. And I know, uh, yeah. you know, moving a lot of weights, you know, weight is really important to you. Yeah, and that's... Yeah. yeah, so I decided, okay, I'm going to do MRI, but more than likely I'm going to do the surgery, and yeah. I'm going to look at at least a couple of months, yeah. probably maybe longer. So how long did they say you were going to be out, you know, after the surgery? Uh, he, told, he told me at that time in checking everything, and after the MRI, uh, the surgeon, you know, he kept just saying, well, you were very, very active before. He said, just expect a timely fashion. Yeah. And, of course, I tried to nail him down on a time, you know, one <laughs> month. Yeah, it's hard to. Six months. And he just said, you know, I'm not going to give you a straight time frame because it depends on your body healing, yeah. depends on what kind of rehab or recovery. He said, you work hard, so you probably should recover very quickly. Uh, he said, he did tell me, which really, really helped. Um, I was really concerned uh, about him cutting into the actual shoulder and cutting into the bursa sac and things like that. You and never then, want to have anybody cut into your sack. Definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. Uh, so I was I was worried, and because I'd, I'd heard some horror stories that uh, you know once they cut into that, once they cut in the shoulder, your shoulder will never be the same. They'll tell you, oh yeah, you'll get your hundred percent range of motion back, but you'll never pick up anything over forty pounds without pain again. And obviously, since weightlifting, I, I like to do that. That was a huge concern that. I spoke to him a couple of times on, he said, no, he said, there's no reason to cut into the shoulder, no reason to cut into any of that. He said, uh, you can very easily move all that to the side, you just take your time being the surgeon. Yeah. And uh, he said, there's no reason why to get into the shoulder at all. You know, after you had your surgery, were you doing, I know once your pain subsided, I know you probably had major pain right afterwards, were you able to, you know, do any type of tr- training, you know, jogging or exercise bike or anything of that sort to keep you keep you going? The the surgery happened uh, on a Thursday. I tried he told me not he told me not to do anything at all uh, for two weeks. And the first week for sure it was not hard at all not to do anything because I didn't want to do anything. It hurt so bad. Um, but after the week um, it felt like things were, you know, a little bit better. Um, I was still in the, the sling that I ha- was wearing. I did try and jog, and it, I made it one lap out of a, it's like, a, I think, six times around for a mile. Made it one lap and uh, just hurt too bad. And so about the only thing I could do is I got on the, uh, uh, I couldn't do the elliptical because I couldn't hold on to the handles. Um, so I got on the stationary bicycle, and uh, I did that. I tried the, the stairs, couldn't do it. But the bicycle, I could sit and do at a good pace. How long were you out all together before you finally got back on the mats? Um, well, just before, well, I would say, I would say an easy two months. Um, we did try and do just because I'd been doing all the stretching. We had tried to do just some slight, some light drilling, like pummeling and, and stuff. Some pummeling, yeah, and that. We had to. I almost wouldn't recommend it, just because if if you had a training partner that isn't going to watch out for you, it would have not been worth it. Okay. But it was sore. It was very tender. But we just did very little, very light, and it was just enough to kind of get back in the game to give me, you know, give me hope that okay, I'm, I can do this. I can come back from this. And, and that's what we did. So talking to Mike beforehand here, he actually came up with a pretty good way to let his training partners know uh, which one of his is his bad arm you know he's it's still not rolling 100 percent yet it's a kind of a new injury but go ahead and you know tell us tell everybody your idea of what yeah. you're doing yeah uh, my my thought was okay you know i i want to start rolling as soon as possible even if it's light rolling even if it's you know 10 percent, and even if i just drilling you know but i also wanted to protect myself and uh, so i already had in mind and talked with some of the guys at the gym to know, okay, don't roll with this person because he's brand new. You know, it's too risky. Don't roll with this person because he always goes guns blazing. So it's, you know, he might not be that careful. We kind of figured out who I could train with really, really lightly. And then I just started thinking, how can I, 
you know, what should I do? Paint an X on my arm, you know, wear a glove. <laughs> and that's when I kind tattoos. of Yes, yeah, <laughs> tattoos, don't touch, uh, radioactive sign or something. Um, and then I had the idea, uh, I don't know if I, I don't know what I saw or if I just watched some basketball or something, but they have those basketball shooter sleeves. Yeah, yep, I've seen those. And they have these newer ones that actually have the pads on the elbow and the shoulder and stuff. And my first thought was, oh, maybe I should do that, get some padding for my shoulder in case I roll onto it. And then I thought, well, my shoulder doesn't really hurt, but the shirt that I was looking at was a full long sleeve shirt. I was like, I wonder if they just make those just for the sleeve, just like the, you know, yeah. pros use and whatnot. So I looked up, and sure enough, you know, it took me a while to find some um, that were reasonably cheap that I could get a pair for because I wanted more than one. So I figured, well, I can just get some bright color, you know, red or green or something and slide that on my bad arm, which is my left arm. And then I don't have to keep telling them, you know, when we started pummeling before I had it, that's what it was. Was yeah. it this arm? Is it that arm? Yeah. So we so, have to slow down. So it just makes it nice and easy. You have so, that yeah. fluorescent, you know, yellow armband or sleeve. Yeah. So everybody knows. And it goes from goes from the wrist all the way up to my shoulder. Um, so, you know, short sleeve, gi, um, you see the whole thing. You grab the bicep, you see it. You grab the elbow, you see it. You grab the wrist, forearm, any of that, and you see it. Um, and I... I Several of my training partners have said, man, you know, I, you know, many times you don't even, at least skilled grapplers, your eyes are closed anyways. You're just going through, you're scrambling or whatnot. And, uh, even if your eyes are closed, you're going to feel it. Yeah. Yeah. You'd feel a difference. It wasn't the skin. It wasn't the sweat. So they would stop. And I, I would notice too, you know, that they would stop immediately. And so I knew, okay, this is going to work. Well, that's, that's definitely a great tip for our readers, you know, right there or listeners, uh, you know, do they read your podcast very much? Well, some of them probably oh, do. Okay, you know we can uh, guys, we can do that also. Put it in braille <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah. And then, Mike, let's say uh, this happened to one of your training partners, the same injury. What advice would you give uh, to your training partner? You know, to deal with this injury. Um, probably the the the, which I don't know anybody might guess this or say this, but uh, don't get discouraged. You know, don't don't beat yourself up. It might have been a mistake. It might have been an accident. I feel in my place it was more just kind of a fluke accident. Um, I don't blame my training partner at all, of course. Oh, I would. Well, yeah, I could. And the reason I say that, to be honest, I was his training partner that day. <laughs> yeah. So that was a fun day. I'm sorry, Mike. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. You can take me out to lunch or something. <laughs> I already <laughs> did. <laughs> uh, but that, that was... That was probably be the biggest advice is, is don't get discouraged, you know, especially if you want to stay in the game. Uh, we had a, another individual who had a, a little injury for his jaw, and uh, he's never come back. And I, I knew I didn't want to do that, but I didn't know how easily or how long. So I kind of figured a, a six-month time frame before I could actually even roll. And then between, you know, encouragement from you, Gary, and our other guys, you know, well, let's just... Let's just try this and be real careful. If it starts hurting, we'll stop and not push too hard, too fast, but just push a little bit enough to get a, a little bit of measurement of what you enjoy about rolling without the risk being there. Um, the other part of advice I would say for your for your rehab, uh, where I went, uh, they had never seen a, a tear like this before. They had never even done a recovery like this before, so they didn't want to commit. They didn't know what kind of time frame. Uh, we just all we had was to go off of the surgeon, who was very good, but uh, he wasn't there helping me through the rehab either. So I would, if I could do a few more reps of this, or if I could, you know, try a little bit more, then I had to make sure and tell him that. Yeah. So that way I yep. could feel like I was putting a little bit of work in. If I wasn't sore, then I would tell him. And uh, when they weren't looking, I might try and throw a few more reps in, you know, and then they'd turn around and make sure you know i wasn't doing too much but but then when it was hurting i did stop yeah i did listen like i'm not gonna re-injure yeah you definitely don't want to you know it's bad be out another energy. six months yeah that's totally not worth it you know but i'm looking at you know jujitsu is a long-term game you know you want to be in this long term you need to prepare and save her and take care of yourself too so i didn't want to re-injure anything but i would say those would be the, the biggest probably the biggest three things is you know stay involved somehow there were several times i couldn't roll um i just went to the gym and watched yeah and that was that was fun enough for me because as most of us know you get in and you get it in your head and you practice in your head yeah and that's just as almost as it's not as good but it's almost as good as plus you get to 
get to see your your training partners, your buddies. Yeah. You know, you stay in contact with the yeah. with the guys and girls at your gym there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that was that would be the biggest thing. Stay involved. Don't get discouraged. And then you know, listen to your body while you're putting in the work to rehab it out. You know, and, and for sure get the surgery done. You know, doctors go to school for a reason. Yeah. They're 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 professionals. They're professionals. Yeah. You know. Uh, get a good, get someone good, and if nobody knows who they are, then uh, you might need to keep looking for a, a doctor. Yep. That's one thing is my surgeon. Several people knew who he was. A lot of people recommended him, and he really did a fantastic job. So yep. I, it's a, uh, yeah, it's been as good as probably it could have been. Yep. So. Well, Mike, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story, and you know, it definitely. Uh, you know, it'll help other people, you know, in the future. But thank you so much. <clears throat> hey, sure thing. Glad to. Uh, if there's anything else, you know, I'll keep, I'm, I'll be continuing listening to you guys, of course, there. But if I can help with anything, hopefully, hopefully this will help somebody out there. Thank you. You got it. All right, guys, we have Will Horneff on the line with us today to talk about his back injury. How are you doing today, Will? I'm doing great. How you guys doing? Oh, we're doing great. We're glad you, uh, yeah, I could share your story and uh, take a little bit of time this afternoon to tell us about it. Yeah, thank you. Could you uh, introduce us to yourself, who you are, where you train, and, and uh, a little bit of background if you could? Sure, absolutely. Um, my name is Will Horner. I have a gym in New Jersey in Bergen County called uh, Training Grounds Jiu-Jitsu and MMA. I'm, uh, I, got my, I got my black belt from Health Gracie, um, and I've been training about, uh, this is about 2000 and three or 2004, something like that, 10, 11 years. I, um, I originally started at, with, uh, Henzo Gracie in the city. You know, I got my blue belt from him, my purple belt from, uh, one of his black belts, Sean Williams, got my brown belt from a whole other Gracie affiliate, and then my black from House. I've just been always, like, moving around at different places, so I did, I, unfortunately, I didn't have the ability to stay at one place for the majority of my training, but I've had some really excellent training partners and teachers up through the years, and I really feel like, uh, you know, grateful for that, that teaching that I got. Um, but now we have a school, and I just, that's kind of what I do full time. Um, I, uh, I used to, uh, you know, do, uh, you know, a bunch of random stuff, and then I eventually settled that, you know, I really love teaching, and I really love training, and I, I wanted to open up a school that, uh, you know, it has a really good environment that people can kind of relax in. And, uh, it's, it's been a great, great journey so far. And, Will, you said, uh, uh basically you, uh, uh, your gym there is a uh, training guards, uh, jiu jitsu, training ground jiu jitsu and MMA in Bergen, New Jersey. Yep. Do you have a website or a Facebook page that you could let yeah, us yeah. know about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the website is, um, NJ for New Jersey. And then just the words, you know, together, training grounds, uh, dot com. It's, you know, two G's, training grounds. And, um, the Facebook is, uh, you know, it's just under training grounds jiu jitsu and MMA. And, uh, we have a website. Uh, it's not open to, like, the public, but, um, at the moment, but it's uh, kind of like a video membership site that I just provide for my students, you know, so that every, every class that we do, like, um, we film it pretty much. Kind of like the way Marcelo oh. Garcia does and then these people do, um, just so that students always have a technique library to refer back to to see what they did a month ago or a year ago, stuff like that. And that's a TG, you know, for training ground, tgstudent.com. Oh, that's awesome. That is a great yeah, tool right I just, there. I, I just feel like students learn better when they can kind of have some a resource like that at their disposal. Um, you know, we don't charge anything for it for, you know, current members. We just want them to learn. Another really cool thing I've started doing at my gym, I, and I never, I don't know why I haven't seen this around more, is like um, we actually set up this kind of audio feed where as soon as I teach a move, it like goes up on TVs around the academy in a loop. You know, so oh. it's like constantly up there, so you can constantly refer to it as you're drilling. So I try to do a bunch of cutting edge stuff like that at my academy to make the I guess the learning of the sport easier. That's we're a pretty cool idea. So, so they, they just look up and see what they were doing. I can't remember if he used his right hand or left hand. They look up and yeah, see what it is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we always have assistance on the mat helping in addition to the main instructor. But, yeah. you know, I, I always hated when I was a student, you know, having to, you know, realize you've been drilling something wrong for like yeah. the last few minutes, you know, before the instructor gets to you. So I wanted to find a way that's, to kind of minimize that. That's, that's pretty innovative because you're going to look around at the other students anyway. Even right, with assistance exactly. helping, you're still going to, okay, they're doing it this way. Is that, the, is that the way you did it? And then you try it and you don't know. That's cool. Yep. Um, before we yeah, get on okay. to, your, to your injury, I do want to mention a, a way that people may have seen you before, I guess. Um, you were in one of the yep. greatest movies I've ever seen. Um, I loved it as a kid. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about Thanks. that? Yeah, so I mean, when I was uh, 12 years old, 
I was in a film called The Sandlot, which was a baseball movie and it's become a classic these days. Um, I played Phillips. I was the, the bully in the movie, the leader of the bad baseball team that would come up and have uh, fights with some of my kids. Uh, it's true, I have been told probably over 500 times in my life that I, I play ball like a girl. <laughs> um, so that's the <laughs> same thing people say to me. Um, and it's true, I do play ball like a girl. It's kind of why I do jiu-jitsu and all these other you know, combat sports, because i just always horrible at any school sports. Could not throw a ball to save my life or catch a ball. So, but I thought I had more of an act for uh, combat sports, which is good. And, um, yeah, so I was in that. Uh, they, uh, they gave that to me just because I had originally got cast in a different film called The Far Off Place. And then they kind of uh, changed the roles to be older and they gave me the Samot roles. So they were just saying, you know, sorry about that. And I'm so glad because, you know, seeing what it turned into and what a you know, great kind of family movie it was, I thought it was just like a, an excellent trade. And um, it's just, it was a really great period of time in my life, you know, being 12 years old uh, on a movie set in the middle of Utah, just just some random field in between houses with a bunch of other kids your age. And um, we had like a lot of camaraderie on the set between, you know, us and uh, I guess just me and the family kids, you know, amongst the the guys that had speaking roles in the film. And uh, it was just a really great experience, man. I I don't think I've ever done anything past that to really... uh, Eclipse the Sandlot, and that's uh, that's fine by me because it was a great film. Yeah, that is it's an it's a great movie, and uh, I feel sorry for people that haven't seen it. Um, you know, maybe they're a little bit too young or something. Go go get that movie or watch it on whatever you watch movies on. Um, yeah, it it. Um, when I heard that you were in that movie, I immediately called my little sister because we watched it. I don't know how many a hundred times probably. <laughs> And she was so excited about it <laughs> that you, that you were uh, willing to do this with us. So, um, yeah, it's, it's funny. It's like funny. Students, uh, you know, no one really knows that I had any kind of acting background until, so, like, you know, I'd be like, after like four months, somebody, you know, was like, hey, I Googled, you know, you last night to see some maybe of your tutorials or your competition footage, and I, I found out that you were in the sand line. They're always like really shocked by that kind of stuff. So it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, Hey, there, there's a, it's funny, like, cause when I was younger, I used to do, you know, being from ages 12 to, you know, 16, you're kind of in that little, like, teeny bopper phase where you're, like, in magazines that are called, like, teen bop and stuff like that. And there's, like, a whole host of pictures that I wish I could, like, take off the internet. <laughs> and now I'm, like, me and, like, no shirt and overalls and, like, <laughs> it's, like rid- ridiculous teen stuff, you know? <laughs> so inevitably, when people Google my name, they, they see some, like, a little picture of me in like overalls, you know, with like no shirt. It's like, ah, oh, that's your judicial instructor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh. Well, I'll put a, I'll put a picture with this uh, article, and I won't use one of those. So maybe it'll bump one of those yeah, down please. a notch. <laughs> <laughs> please, thank you. <laughs> so let's get onto your injury a little bit here. What happened? Sure. Well, you know, I was uh, I was trained. I have had tons of injuries in jiu-jitsu, By the way, I've had you know LCL. MCL, luckily I've never had an ACL, but I've had a meniscus, I've had my elbow popped, I've broken my ankle, and so like I've had so many injuries, so I, gotta, I can definitely uh, you know, give you guys a, some of my experience and kind of how I overcame stuff. Um, I had a major injury of my lower back, I had a pretty bad herniated disc, and I had five bulge discs, and this was about 2007, I think, and... Uh, it was one of those things where it didn't actually happen from jujitsu. It happened from me doing kettlebell swings with too heavy of a kettlebell and then just letting my form, you know, get too sloppy. And then it just, I kind of felt something happen. And for anybody that's ever had a back injury or, or a herniated disc, and it was a pretty severe one too. It's, it, the pain is just constant and it's just, it's unrelenting. And it's one of those things where it doesn't matter if you're standing or if you're laying down, it's just, it's just something. It's like a, constant throbbing uncomfortable feeling um and it was just horrible i couldn't train jiu-jitsu so i just stopped training and said hey you know maybe it's going to get better on its own then i went to um i actually didn't didn't go see a doctor first i went to one of my friends who was a pt and i did pt for about three months and uh it didn't do anything for it and so i saw a doctor who was a uh orthopedic surgeon uh he sent me to get an mri i had the mri and, and he looked at it and he said, just listen, man, this is, this is, a, I know what you do, and this is a career-ending in, injury. It's, you're not going to be able to do jiu-jitsu anymore. You're not going to be able to compete anymore uh, in the way that you have been, and you're going to have to get surgery for it. There's just, I mean, you can get a second opinion on this, but it's, this is the way it is. 
And that was like, the last thing you want to hear when you're a purple belt. I mean, it's like the worst thing. Because, you know, if you get to purple belt in jiu-jitsu, you're going to get to black belt. It's, it's always really the blue belts that kind of wash out, you know, because the purple belt is really the hard thing to get to. And so that was a real, real downer. It, it really was a, a tough thing to hear. So I, of course, decided that I wasn't going to accept that and that I was going to find some other way to heal it. And so I did tons of research online and forums and hearing what other people said. And I found that there was this machine called the ontologic machine. And that's just one variation. I mean, they have a ton of variations of it. But what it basically does, and some chiropractors have it, some uh, physical therapy places have it, it, they strap you in where it straps in your upper body and it straps in your lower body separate. And what it will do for a period of about 30 minutes is it will try to separate your spine or to pull the two halves apart at different intervals and at different tensions because what what happens is that when you have a herniated disc, your back is, those muscles are constantly, constantly spasming, right? Because the gel is, is poking out and it's basically hitting, hitting the nerves. And so the idea is you got to get that gel, the disc, to come back inside. And so because there's all that tension, it can't. So what this machine does is it basically tricks your muscles into relaxing. And what I, what I had to do is for a period of one month, uh, five days a week, I had to have these sessions. There were 30 minutes a session, and you would just sit in the machine and read a book, and you would just feel it basically pumping your back, back and forth. And the idea behind it is that if you had, for instance, got one of those machines, uh, or, or those things like the cheater hang-ups where you can hang upside down and just kind of you know, do decompression, the problem with those kind of machines is that once you do that, after you know a few seconds, your back is going to tighten up even more because it feels itself being stretched apart. Whereas a machine like this, before your back has that ability to tighten up as, as, a, as a result of being stretched, it loosens up again. So it's constantly pumping your back. And what happened was, I mean, I had, I was, and I, actually in this book, it wasn't four months until I did this. It was probably about, it was four months actually until I did the physical therapy, and it was about another four months until I started doing the machine. So it was about eight months of just pain. And then after doing this machine for 30 days, I was pain-free, so I didn't have any more pain. And then I basically started doing uh, programs to really strengthen my core, because the way that this guy told, talked to me about my injury, he said, listen, you have a, when you have a herniated disc, you're going to get it to go back inside. That's not going to be a problem. But the issue is it's going to be there. And so you, it's like having a crack in a wall, and the crack's going to be there. But what you got to do is you got to attach a million rubber bands to each side of the crack to make sure it can't, you know, open anymore or open yeah. any further. And that's basically what I did. And like now I have an extremely strong core. Um, I, he gave me a ton of exercises to do to really strengthen my core. And I have a very strong core. I never had any issues. Like I wrestle. Oh, after I did that, um, I think it was like a year later, I got my brown belts and then I wound up winning the brown belts uh, in the adult division, no gi pan ams. I think that was in 2009. So it's not like I, I went back to just training and it was like, you know, so so like I was like competitive. I so won your ten AMs, like your injury was two thousand eight, and then in two thousand nine, you you competed in that. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. You know, so it was, uh, and I remember like reading on a forum like some guy who had a herniated disc and he overcame it, and that just kind of gave me the you know, the motivation to think, okay, this is not a career-ending injury, as the doctor's telling me. You know, doctors. I'm not saying all doctors, but like surgeons want to operate. I mean, that's that's their methodology. That's what they think is going to fix some things, right? And sometimes the injury is going to be so severe that you do have to operate. Um, but even with five both discs and one pretty severe herniated disc, I kind of proved that wrong. And so that I have literally no issues with my back whatsoever. Um, I, I wrestle, you know, takedowns. I have D1 wrestlers that I train with. I have really good jiu-jitsu training partners. And my body, my back is, is not an issue, and it hasn't been since then. Um, anytime I ever felt something, like maybe a little bit tight, uh, tightness, I go back on the machine probably for a week, and I'm fine after that. Anytime I've kind of, you know, I get some slacking on my core exercises and maybe, uh, you know, doing too much wrestling or something or too much kettlebells, um, then I start to feel something, but then I back off. Uh, but since then, man, I've, I, I broke my ankle in like a really traumatic injury where I was shooting a double on somebody, and I slipped on sweat, and... Basically, I was in a lunge position, and he sprawled on my back, and it just snapped my leg like a twig, you know, busting, you know, both the oh. tibia and tibia. Um, and I had to have three surgeries after that. Um, and this is as, like, an instructor, you know, like, has to teach classes. 
Um, and, and that was a different thing. I mean, you're going to recover. I have metal in my legs. I don't have any, in, in my ankle. I mean, I don't have any problems. But then there's also the psychological aspect of, of getting injured. Um, that's where most people quit. You know, most people are like, hey, you know what, this is too, I don't know, it's too rough or, you know, my body is not able to keep up with this. And the reality is that's really the farthest thing from the truth. I mean, a lot of, a lot of this has to do with how you train. I don't train like I used to train when I was, you know, 20 years old and having no injuries. I'm, I, I'm no, I don't just like muscle out of things and, and go crazy and I'm not going at 150%, you know, anymore. I train, I train, I train intelligently. I, I, I watch my body and I don't, um, I don't incorporate a lot of lifting either. It was always when I was lifting, specifically like a bodybuilder style workout where you have isolation exercises that you're basically just asking, at least from my experience, to get injured. You know, you, you work on your quads or something and then you're going to go roll later in the day or even the next day. And then you're going to have, you know, one muscle group being more tired than a muscle group, but that's not the way your body works. Your body works as a whole. And then when you train jiu-jitsu as a whole, you're going to tear something, you know? So I'm much more intelligent about the training. I only do kettlebell exercises and I don't do a high volume and I never, I never do it before I train jiu-jitsu. I always do it after my jiu-jitsu workout where I can actually control. Because you can control your lifts um, if you're being smart, but you can't necessarily control the unpredictability of a sparring session. So I really make sure I do that after my sparring session as opposed to before. And, Will, you were talking about, uh, you know, how strong your core is now and doing your uh, core exercises. Like, what exactly core core exercises were you doing? Were you doing planks or, or if you sure. could, you know, give us a little Absolutely. wisdom there? I think a plank, at least for what I was uh, recouping from my herniated desk, I was doing tons of planks, meaning like planks where your elbows and your toes are on the ground. And I would do that for 30 seconds. Then I would raise my right hand while everything else is on the ground, put it down, raise my left hand like I'm you know, straight ahead like Superman. Then it would be my right foot I would raise, and my left foot I would raise, and then it would be my right hand and left foot, and then left hand, right foot. I would go for each of those stations for 30 seconds each. Uh, it, it was It's extremely painful, man. I mean, it's, it's very hard to get through, but I really credit that with tightening up my core such that I didn't have a problem with, you know, my disc anymore. And then I started working back in the uh, kettlebells and making sure that my form was perfect. And the only thing that I ever do with the kettlebells, um, for instance, I train today. And so, listen, I'm like, I, have, I have students. That, um, one of my students is one of the head coach at um, uh, DeFranco's training and on the east coast like defranco's is like defranco's yeah that's that's DeFranco's, yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean even here in the midwest we know yeah okay even in the midwest we know about that is, yep yep the talks. you know so like actually this summer i'm, I'm having i'm having a guy named uh pat carosa is like one of the best trainers over there he's going to be designing a uh a strength and fitness program for our students um so back when that happens i'll have a you know much more uh, to say about this, but what I've been doing just for myself is I'll do one exercise per training session. I'll do a swing today. And then the next day that I train, I'm going to do Turkish get-ups. And then the next day I'm going to train, I'm going to do some uh, windmills. And the next day I'm going to train, you know, I'll do some rows with the kettlebell. Um, so I don't really do, I don't put uh, like a bunch of exercises into one day. Um, maybe that's also because I'm 35 now and I'm not like, you know, I'm not like recuperating super, super fast like that I used to when I was younger. But I also feel it's a little bit safer. And I don't do real high volume. I'll do like uh, maybe three sets of five reps with everything. And I, I use significant weight so that I can only do five, you know, or, or six reps. But I'm not doing singles or doubles or anything like that. Um, my philosophy with training, too, is anything that I can get as far as cardio-wise, right? I want to do that through jiu-jitsu. Maybe do round robins. Maybe be like have me be the only person and have person after person come, you know, in a new fresh person every two minutes. Um, so I don't really use like, uh, you know, supplemental training for cardio. I use supplemental training for strength and for explosiveness, but anything cardio-wise, I get for my jiu-jitsu because I think it's just better to work your cardio while you're working your skill anyway. Um, and that also allows me to be, um, I, it doesn't allow me, me to be very tired when I'm doing my lifts, you know, because I don't want to be tired. That's why I hurt my back to begin with is being tired doing a cardio workout, you know, I'm doing like 30 kettlebell swings and another 30 in two minutes and then you get tired and your posture suffers and then you hurt your back. So I don't really do that kind of stuff anymore. 
Sounds like you have a, a system to keep yourself safe and, and be able to train hard and effectively. Yeah, set up. yeah, it works for me. You know, I mean, like I said, when when Pat designs something else, you know, probably have some ten billion times better for me. But I just noticed with my body and all my injuries, I like to error where I am safe and leaving something on the map. Because when you've had as many injuries as I have, you know, it's like when I when I calculate all the time off that I have taken, you know, because of my injuries. You know, let's say I've been training jiu-jitsu for 10 years, and we're talking probably about, like, I don't know, really, you know, seven years of real training, six and a half, you know, something like that. Because, and so it's like, I'd rather maybe not kill myself, you know, where I'm kind of overdoing it and have more longevity than, you know, just go balls to the wall every single workout and maybe pull something. You know, that's just how it is. Yeah. I'm curious, what was the the name of the machine you... You mentioned you were using- Yeah, it was called the – there's a bunch of different ones like this now, but the main one that I looked up when I was doing it, it's called the Ontologic, and I think it's called A-N-T-A-L-G-I-C, Ontologic Machine. Okay. And what is that? Is that one – do you lay down in it or sit in it, and then it moves you around a little bit? Or there's, that's Yeah, there, well, there's different types. Like some you – some are you're going to be like laying down as if you're on the table. Others, they have you like kind of kind of on an angle. Um, the one I had, you're you're kind of on an angle, and you're basically it's, imagine imagine being in a seat, and they're going to strap your legs into the seat, strap your waist into the seat, all right? And then above the seat, there's like another piece that goes from like your mid back up, and that part they're going to strap that around your chest and your arms, so it can separate you your back right in the middle if it needs to. And they're just going to keep pumping that for thirty minutes back and forth. Uh, it, specifically timed intervals to make sure that your back does not tense up while it's doing this. Huh. Does it, is it uncomfortable or does it feel good or? No, it feels amazing. <laughs> That's good. Oh yeah. It was like relief. Cause you feel like relieved from any kind of pain, you know, while you're in it. Um, you know, and the, and the people like that do this, they're going to be very, very careful to make sure they're not putting on too high of a setting too soon. So they start you out real low. You hardly feel like anything's happening. And then they keep bumping you up as your progress, you know, gets better. And, Will, if uh, one of your training partners uh, basically had this injury and, and came to you to get some advice, what would you tell your training partner? What advice would you give? Well, you know, two things. Like, first of all, like, I have um, – I'm fortunate because in my academy I have um, an excellent chiropractor, a guy named uh, Dr. Scott Gardner. I have probably – I've never met a physical therapist like this other guy also who trains with me named uh, Dr. Rich Kim. Like, literally, I was having a problem with my neck where I literally could not sleep on my right side for, like, five months, but I was too busy to kind of deal with that. You know, it didn't hurt my training or anything. And um, I went into him, and I was a little skeptical at first, and he literally, like, stabbed me, like, 20 times with these needles in my neck, like, the one side. And, uh, and I have not had a problem with my neck since. It, it's and he's able to like pinpoint certain things and just like fix you, you know. So um, I send, depending on my students' issues, to uh, one of those two guys. And then if a student has a uh, like a lower back injury, like I had, then I have another person that I'll send them to do to do the ontologic machine. So I pretty much send them to who they need. We have really great resources here at the gym. And depending upon the injuries that my students have. I'll say either you listen, you got to completely stop training, or you can train, uh, you know, by just drilling. Uh, and I'll give you moves that you can still drill, so that you feel like you're still progressing, um, as long as it's not going to exacerbate any kind of, you know, you know, the injury that you have. You're really depending upon what it is. Like if you have a wrist injury, fine, you're just going to wrap that up, and you can just work, you know, you know, recovering your guard and that kind of stuff, you know. Um, but I always try to help them find a way to train around it, so that they don't get out of the practice of training. Because I kind of noticed myself. When you start getting out of the practice of training, really, it's hard to like get back into the gym. So if you maintain the practice, they can still feel like they're progressing. But when you have an injury, like a lower back or something like that, you gotta you gotta just stop. You have to deal with that first, you know. And I try to just explain to the students that listen, you gotta be mentally strong when you have an injury to come back because that's the hardest thing, just getting back on the mat after. Because you're in a question whether this is right for you or whether you can do this, whether there's something wrong with your body. Um, and the people that usually are getting injured are mostly like the, uh, you know, the beginners, you know, the white belt, blue belts, you know, it, I stopped getting injured as much once I was brown and black belt, you know, because you're using the right technique at the right moment. You know, you're not really like, forcing anything out of, you know, a lack of knowledge. You know, you know where to, where to speed up and where to back off from things. 
So I think there's an element of knowledge, too, that kind of factors into getting injured as well. Sounds like you've got a great team team over there. I've got a bunch of resources yeah. for your students. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, we appreciate you coming on here and sharing your story with us. It's been different uh, experience you had and, and different way of getting around it that you uh, found yourself back on the mats and doing well, you know, a year later. So that's really neat. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. You know, people just have to understand that with injuries, if you're in a squad like jiu-jitsu, an injury is going to happen. It's either going to happen because you have a training partner who's not controlled or maybe you're not controlled and you're really pulling something too hard that you shouldn't be pulling or not tapping out quick enough. Um, but the, the main thing is you always just got to remember why you got into this in the first place. You know, what are the reasons that motivated you to start training jiu-jitsu or MMA or whatever you're doing? And basically determine if those reasons are significant enough for you to go through the injury, strengthen yourself even more, and maybe adapt your training to make sure, put in some safeguards to make sure this stuff doesn't happen again, or at least to kind of mitigate that as much as you can. And so that's my best advice. Well, thanks for helping me here. Uh, we appreciate it. It is a pleasure talking with you. Thank you guys, too. Talk to you later. All right. Bye. Thanks, Will. All right. We want to thank our friends and the listeners that, that were willing to share their stories with us and, and help uh, the community as a whole um, learn more about some of the injuries that are more common in the sport and some of them that are rare and, and things you might be going through if you're experiencing that injury or if your teammate is. Um, thanks a lot, and I think you, you're, all these stories will have helped, helped many people today. Yeah, definitely, and it's definitely going to help uh, some of our listeners and BJJ uh, people around the world, you know, when they do have that injury. But also, too, you know, just these these injuries, It, you know, it's a great, I don't know, it kind of got me just realized how tough some of these people are and, you know, how you can get through anything. You know, a lot of tough-minded individuals who you can put a wall up in front of them and, and they're going to find a way to knock that wall down and get around that wall. You know, the easy thing is just to uh, sit back and quit and, uh, you know, decide, uh, you know, I'm going to just sit back, never do it again. But, you know, these stories are very inspirational. It kind of really uh, got me in a great mood just listening to all these stories and, you know, people uh, people winning, you know, winning out on this injury and coming back and winning tournaments afterwards or, or even just competing or, or training every day afterwards. It's just uh, just incredible. Yeah, and and you you know, um, you've just listened to to many stories about people getting hurt. It's important that if you're fairly new to the sport, we don't all get hurt all the time. I mean, this is, some of these stories are pretty crazy, and um, you know, I you know Gary and I have each trained for over twelve years, and we neither one of us had have had to have surgery for any sort of injury we've had, but we've been fortunate so far. But um, you know, the, the beautiful thing about Jitsu is that since we're so close to um, constantly, you know, armbar and are hurting each other. That we're aware of this, that, that these things don't happen by surprise a lot of times. So I know if I got a guy's arm like this and and I'm starting to extend it, I know he's ready to be done, and and he's going to tap. I'm expecting that. So there's a, I think there's a, it's safer than it would seem from the outside. Yeah, yeah, and definitely be a good training partner. You know, don't destroy your your partners. Don't try to take their arm home and mount it on your, your fireplace, <laughs> you know, and yeah. don't be afraid to tap. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, tapping is a key. When I first started, I, I didn't tap as quick as I did. My ego was a, a little bit large, if you could say, but through the time I've learned, when I'm tapping, I'm learning, and uh, I'm, I, it's good to tap. It's going to keep me healthy, and I'm going to learn, so can't go wrong with that. Solid advice there, Gary. Join us next week for another episode. Um, don't forget to swing by the Facebook page. Um, and like the page if you haven't already and, and comment. And you could, you could win one of the rash cards that, or, that we're giving away from uh, fujisports.com. Comment, like, or share the, the episode or a picture of the rash card that we have on there. And that'll enter you, you into the, uh, to the drawing. And it could be you, my friend. Yeah, and everybody who's seen the rash cards, me and Byron have been wearing them. They're all loving them. Uh, they're great rash cards to roll in. They look great. So definitely get in on the contest. You know, like, share, uh, change your profile picture to, to double your, you know, to get two entries. And also don't forget to check out FujiSports.com. Uh, geese, uh, shorts, T-shirts, gear bags, a little bit of everything. Quality products, quality service. 
Absolutely. Thank them for the support that they're giving us as well. Um, if you'd like to send us an article or a quote of the week, we would be more than happy to, to get that from you. Our email is bjjbrick at gmail.com or any comments you have about the show, we're happy to hear from you guys. Yep, and don't uh, don't forget to uh, give us reviews on iTunes. You know, we appreciate uh, everybody who's taking the time to give us a review. And, you know, we want to make a better show for everybody, and those, that's one of the ways to help us out. So thank you if you do it, or if not, you can even send us an email and let us know what you think. And we'll definitely take that to heart. So thank you. Yep, thank you, my friends, for listening. We'll catch you next week. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Watch it, jerk. Shut up, idiot. Moron. Scab eater. Butt sniffer. Yeah. Puss licker. Fart smeller. <laughs> you eat dog crap for breakfast, geek. You mixed your weeds with your mama's toe jam. Yeah. You pop for apples in the toilet, and you like it. You play ball like a girl. What did you say? You heard me.